Tennessee's two term out, or how does that work? He's in his second, isn't he? comes up as opposed to the first part of the meeting? I, that's, I know, but that one is like about six floats. That makes him look sound like he's a uh, No problem. Yeah. I'm good. We're, we're kind of, it ain't a great law and it was given with no guidance. We're doing the best we can. I appreciate it. Bring um, Wilmington's City Council special meeting for our budget retreat this morning. I will do a roll call at this time. Mayor Pro Tem, are you here? here. Councilman Reinbark, are you here? Councilmember Anderson, are you here? Councilman Barnett, are you here? Here. Councilmember Spears, are you here? Here. Councilmember Waddell, are you here? Okay, and the chair is here. This time I'm going to turn this meeting over to our city manager, Mr. Caudle. Mr. Caudle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council. Uh, obviously, what we need to do from now on when we put our schedules together is overlay the calendar of the school system with the calendar of the um, with the calendar of the city, and I apologize for that. Um, as uh, Mr. Anderson pointed out to us, I'm, I'm accustomed to uh, college college spring breaks, and I've forgotten about what it is for uh, for school spring breaks. But we will endeavor to get you out of here as quickly as we can today. We've got uh, some the items are pretty front loaded with uh, some very important information we want you to to hear and to talk about. But today, uh, this is the uh, work session where we actually bring to you. Uh, probably some very formulated uh, and very in focus items. Most importantly, our objectives for today are to obtain some direction on the strategies and the implementation measures that we're talking about putting in place for the FY23 budget. We are finalizing those as a result of this meeting. We're trying to frame the, finan the city's financial position for you to give you an idea of where we stand not only where we stood at the, at the close of the last fiscal year, but where we believe we are in the current fiscal year and where we'll close this one out. Most importantly, probably, uh, this is the day for you to get to discuss uh, and understand the agency request. You'll know, note that we have two outside uh, processes and we'll be producing uh, or uh, presenting uh, information on both of those. And Mr. Joy will have some guidance for you on that when we get to that item. 
We also have some uh, CIP items that we need to finalize. As you know, when we plan over the five or six year period, there are things that pop up every now and then, and we have to deal with those. So we're gonna ask for some guidance and share that with you today. And then we're gonna talk about some regulatory changes. I think it's important to note again that this is your final opportunity to provide guidance as we go, th go through the process and uh, develop our, our proposed budget that will be coming to you around the 1st of May. With that, I'll pause and ask and see if anybody's got any questions. If not, I'll ask Ms. Mortel to come forward and talk to you a bit about budget development strategies. Good morning. I think Dylan and I are fighting with it. There we go. Um, similar to all the other work sessions we've had two so far, we have the strategies that we'd like you to provide us some information and make this a collaborative effort. So far, we have the acceleration of the transportation pro, um, projects in three years. We have remained competitive with the compensation package, continue our Rise Together initiative, selective increase in service deliveries. We want to be strategic with our fund balance, prioritize enhancements based on key strategies, be a little more aggressive with our cost projections because of inflation, be more aggressive and be modest with our revenue projections based on current trends and the environment that we have in front of us. The competitive agency process, we have two of them going this year, which is somewhat uh, irregular, but it does happen probably every six years. And then we have affordable housing. And I don't want to forget the three items that you've already mentioned that we should focus on, which is the re um, street rehab, which should be citywide. The intern program, which um, the HR is working on increasing that, or looking at that policy to include younger, maybe teenage to young adults to come work for the city. And then the um, competitive process, we're looking at the percentage for the financial management policies. So if you have any questions as we move through this, please let Mr. us Robert know. Are these uh, strategies in order of importance? No, Okay, sir. thank you, that's all I want to know, thank you. And with that, I will um, bring up Aubrey Parsley to talk about the Civic Partnership. Mr. Mayor, while Mr. Parsley is getting together, would you like me to go ahead and brief council on the uh, new statute that applies? Arbor, you want to hold on for a second? You want to sit right up front? Let, sure. Let, let our city attorney go ahead and share with the, us. This is just a reminder and an opportunity for council to make anything known that they need to. A statute went into effect January 1st of this year. It was passed in late December. It is a new statute, 14-234.3. It effectively says that any council member who is a director or an officer or on the board of directors of a nonprofit that is not created by the state or local government will have to recuse themselves by function of law from any deliberation or any vote on any contract, loan, grant, or appropriation. So I believe that some council members are actually on some of the boards of a few of the entities that are a part of this. When that entity comes up, then that council member will not be able to take part in any deliberations about that particular entity. It's my interpretation that that council member can participate in the overall discussion as long as they don't try to influence on behalf of that uh, nonprofit that they are on the board of. So I would ask council to make the clerk aware, as the statute contemplates, of any of the nonprofits that they're on the board of that are in this section. And I believe council has had a chance to look at those and see which ones may affect you. John, I don't want to get into the technical aspect of it, but if, if I, any one of us, and we all serve on different boards, committees, and organizations, in the course of our work with these organizations, if I come across and speak to Councilman Rivenbark or Mayor Pro Tem Haynes and tell them what a wonderful job the particular, the particular group that I'm engaged in is doing, can we say that? Um, 
if it's in the discussion or deliberation that goes to the broadest is an appropriation, then I would recommend that you not. And I would remind council and the public who's watching that this does not apply if the council member simply works with that nonprofit. It is only if you are a director, officer, or on the board of that nonprofit. Interesting. In the case of, uh, let's just use an example, the Lower Cape Fair Water and Sewer Authority. That was created by what? That, that was created by the city and the county working together. No, 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 that no. Is Lo Lower Cape Fear, not the Cape Fear Public oh, Utility Authority. Lower Cape Fear Water and Sewer Authority. Lower Cape Fear, not the CFP. Right. UA. If that was created, and I don't know specifically, but if it was created by a local government, then it is immune. This does not apply to, to Thank you. being on that. So, Mr. Mayor, if council members want to go ahead and make um, the clerk aware of any boards that they're an officer of that are in this, then when those come up, they can simply not participate. So let me go back. So if Charlie asked me about a program on an organization or a board that I'm on, that asked me how effective the program has been, I'm not allowed to say to him what I think the program is doing? According to the statute, you're not allowed to seek to influence his deliberation or vote. But you can state the facts. I would not interpret this to say you can't state the facts. I don't think the um, General Assembly would be trying to limit that. They simply are trying to stop folks from influencing. And that's a very small hair to split. But Our yeah, business I is influence. <laughs> And, and that's just when you're deliberating on appropriations, right? I mean, if we're not up here, they can have that discussion all day long. If it's not part of a deliberation, and the broadest category is other appropriations. It's contract, loan, grant, other appropriations. I'd like a copy of the statute, please. Not, not right now, but just some point. Certainly. Okay. All right. Aubrey? Thank you and good morning. Just have a few slides for you all on one of our competitive processes that's run under the economic development function of the city, the Civic Partnerships Program. It's a program that's been going on for a number of years as we reviewed uh, not, not too long ago, back in, I believe it was, it was January. And it's a very popular program. We received uh, a lot of applications for it uh, for this cycle and we'll, we'll get into the specifics to that. But first, I just want to take an opportunity to zoom out a bit, um, having listened to prior discussions about competitive processes for nonprofits or, or agency contributions as it's titled here. Uh, there's been discussion uh, about city contributions versus county contributions, so I want to take a 30,000 foot view of that and capture that for you all here over the last three fiscal years. This is the, the breakdown in, um, in, in thousands. So. Uh, roughly $2 million in, in FY24, the uh, city of Wilmington, and roughly $500,000 for the county in FY20 and, and so forth for the remaining years. Uh, and as you can see, the, the trends have changed over time, and as has the, the proportion of the general fund expenditures that um, the city is putting toward these types of contributions. Uh, the, uh, the, the proportion for the city hasn't changed much, but the, but the proportion for the county has. And this, this graph is just meant to highlight that fact and sort of show you all the overall landscape of, of what these contributions look like for our local units of government. Um, getting a little bit more specific into what the city does versus what the county does, the, the county's a little heavier on contributions toward the economic development type agency. Uh, functions. Uh, they, they do about 40% of their overall contributions to economic development, whereas the city does roughly 22% of contributions for agency funding toward um, the economic development type functions. Uh, so zooming in on our program specifically in, in civic partnerships, as I mentioned a couple months back, uh, the, the program received a lot of attention this cycle. We received 17 applications up from 11 uh, different entities that were funded last, uh, last go around. 
So that's a, obviously a significant uptick. Uh, all of our folks who were funded last for the last program came back and, and reapplied, and many of them reapplied for, not, not a surprise, more funding. Uh, and then new, some new applicants uh, have, have come on the scene as well. And those are highlighted in, in blue there on the left. Uh, more applications, more, more requests in terms of dollars. Uh, so the, the amount that staff look to allocate over the, the applicants that, that we received, which met the eligibility criteria, we, we had allocated or we were given the guidance that $566,000 was the amount to spread over these agencies. But we received a little bit over a million dollars in requests. So as you might imagine, it was, it was a difficult task since many of these organizations have great reputations and, and do great things out in the community. Um, a few of the applications, though, upon review of our selection committee, just Aubrey, simply, yes, sir, I'm sorry. Uh, do, do we know that the new and the returning are also applying toward the county? Uh, I don't know if they have, I have a slide on that in a bit in terms of what they've been funded for previously, but I don't know if they've reapplied for the county this go around, but I think it's safe to say if they've received previous funding, they're likely to, very likely to reapply for this fiscal year. And you're, you're lumping the new ones in that as well? Yes, sir. We can, the, there's a table that goes through that. We'll, we'll show county contributions by agency. Okay, because we have, if they're new to us, we haven't, they have, we haven't funded them before, and you've got about six or seven new ones over here. Yes, sir. See what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at that here in a minute, and no problem. Oh, Aubrey, while well, we got you for a second, stopping. Um, I know I, I, we discussed this on your last presentation, and I don't want to <clears throat> stay on it too long, but looks like quite a few of them did submit applications late, and, and I know we discussed this in the last work session, but do we have a suggestion for an amended policy in future years for having how we're going to handle late applications and try and encourage timely application. I mean, that's really just for staff to be able to handle them in an appropriate time manner. So uh, lessons learned from this last go around were probably the, the, the timing that we roll out, the application announcements could improve. Um, it just coincided with the holidays. So I'd look to, to change the, the timing of that a bit and be more proactive about our communication so as to head off to even having to have this discussion. Uh, there's always the possibility for late applications, and the way the um, advertisement reads is we reserve the right to not accept any late applications, but would defer to uh, council's judgment probably on whether or not to um, still bring in an application that was late and consider it in our review process would be my recommendation. I think going forward, it's not fair to the people who did it on time. Yeah, I, I was going to ask a similar question. I mean... I think whatever they got last year, if we're going to put them in there, if you apply to, say, anything, a job, a university, anything, they don't say, oh, well, we'll think about it. I mean, and I hear you on the – but we've known for – they've known really for years that this was coming. I don't know how – if you don't start punishing people, I'm not saying not to fund them at all, but fund them a little less to give them an initiative to <laughs> make sure to get it in – it is there is a fairness issue and I, you know if, there, if there's never any punishment for it you'll you'll keep getting it well i don't know Understand. that it's punishment it's a choice on their part to not meet the deadline i mean we're it's not a decision on our part they decided to not right. to not uh, meet the deadline like the other people so I, I i i get the holidays and all that but i think going forward we we should really try to stick with the deadline the the arguments I, I've heard, if, if I may, from from the applicants were uh, we we didn't know it was it, the application was being rolled out. We didn't hear uh, we're on a three year cycle, so there's um, there's been turnover in our organization. So and so left, and we didn't know. So we 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 hear things like that. Be, be that what what it may. I, I'd I'd recommend. I think we have everybody in agreement that we had that policy of a. You know, a little leniency is okay, but we have a you know a pretty hard and fast rule of when the, the here's the due date. They're all big. They're all big boys and girls. You know, here's the due date. You submit by the due date if you want taxpayer funding. Um, not only is it not fair to the to the other applicants, but it's not fair to staff who's who's processing. I think that's important. You guys have a lot going on, and you're trying to process this in a finite amount of time. Um, so they need to abide by the regulations everybody else has. Understood. Sounds like. There's pretty much a consensus on that topic, so we'll... Nope. 
no, 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 no consensus. Not for me. Okay. Um, because is there a, a lot of lateness in the submission of these applications or are we just feeling like there's a lot of lateness and we, we're trying to put something in something in place to prevent lateness. I mean, we understand businesses are being run, businesses have issues. So I, I think we're being a little too strict here. I mean, I mean, I'm not saying accept something 30 days late, but we understand how the ramifications of business. So sometimes things happen. Mr. Barnett, I, I just want to say too, because I, I brought this up when it came up the last time, and the reason I brought it up was because um, there were a lot of um, circumstances, you know, COVID, holidays, and things like that. So if we fix that, um, we're going to be fine. I think we're going to be fine. And I know I went through this, and I noticed that some of the new organizations, those who were um, didn't get in on time, they didn't meet because of some other criteria. Right. So. Right. All right. I think I maybe was unclear because when Margaret reacted to it, I obviously didn't state myself. My point was perhaps a way to handle it would be to, to not just completely disallow a late application, but perhaps dock them somehow to, in the future, get them to take a more priority. I wasn't suggesting necessarily just out of hand without knowing all the circumstances that you right. just say no, but. Uh, you know, I don't know. I get late fees for everything. <laughs> is my point. So. But you, you did say punish. Okay, punish. Late fee is a punish. Right. Punish is a harsh word. Hey, Aubrey, Aubrey um, can you just, you know, can you explain exactly how you do notify these folks? What's the process? How many times do are we notify? Are we doing it by certified mail? Are we picking up the telephone? Are we advertising it in the paper? How do we make certain that all of the nonprofits that have received funding in the past years are also aware of the process moving forward? Because I've heard the same exact things. We've executive directors left, new executive director comes in, they right. come in from out of town, doesn't understand or doesn't know the process, and they ultimately come to us up here and they and, and they'll tell us, I didn't know. We do a great job for the community. We have worked with you all in the past. You're not going to be able to fund me for the next two to three years. So you can, 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 you, can you explain to me the process as to how we reach out? Sure. The, the process this last time around was to put out an advertisement and a press release and announce on social media the opportunity to apply to this program. The bit that was that was lacking, and I'll, I'll take ownership of, was during the transition as Ayers left and, and I came in, I would realized that there had not been direct picking up the telephone and calling these organizations to say, hey, applications, uh, the application period has is, is come up again. We hope to see your application. So I didn't, uh, I didn't do that until the last week the applications were due, and that caused a delay for a couple folks what publication are we advertising and what newspapers are we are we putting this in because a lot of people I'm don't even read newspapers anymore they go online and it, it, it was online the, the press release got got publications in a number of different media outlets but Laura, do we advertise in star news okay star news no, no certified mail to the individual organization no how many of them do we have all together uh, we have 11 currently funded under the program. Okay. But in the future, you're going to call them? Yes. So we, really, we, we've had an unusual situation. You, you're new at this. You're correcting that. And going forward, we should have a process that's, that's pretty well set. I think it's great. Thanks for your hard work and changing it, making it better. Okay. Thank you for the discussion. Um, so, already covered this slide. I'll, I'll just jump ahead to a few of the applicants that did not meet the criteria of the Civic Partnerships program. Uh, those are, are shown here in red. They were Canines for Service, NC Swim, and Young Mogul Development. Great organizations, great causes, just did not 
we're not a, a particular fit for this particular program as the selection committee reviewed their applications and reviewed what their missions were and uh, reviewed the criteria of, of civic partnerships. I guess I'm a little confused. Is this all, all of them or is this for economic development? So civic partnerships uh, covers primarily economic development, but, but one of the elements in, in this application that, that may, as you look at some of these, that may throw you off is there, there's a category for cultural draws, tourist draws, so that's how you get film festivals in there, that's how you get the Children's Museum and, and the Arts Museum and the Arts Council in there. So under the purview of economic development, uh, there, there is a, a category for um, tourist draws, cultural regional draws. But these, these three specifically um, were, were much more the category of community development, hu human services type work as opposed to job creation, as opposed to workforce training, as opposed to cultural and tourist draws. Oh. So is there, is, there a, um, is there another area where these three could seek funding or um, I'm just... Yes, sir, I, I believe so. I think they would qualify for, for some other city programs and we, we would advise them uh, as much of what, what programs we thought they could be more, um, that their ask would be more applicable toward, but okay. th this wasn't um, a fit specifically civic partnerships. I, I okay. think it's important to note that NC SWIM is uh, uh, not one of the candidates for this program, and, it, and we do have an ongoing relationship with them. There are other places that this program will be funded through the budget. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thank you. I, I guess I'm surprised to see, um, you know, it, it took a while to define economic development category versus uh, the nonprofit community organizations. So it seems to me that the, the waters have been muddied here a little bit. We used to say that WBD, the Film Commission, and WDI were the economic development the, the three-legged stool of economic development. So now I get Genesis Block, definitely economic development, job training, all of that. Uh, UNCW, we thought that was a one-time thing and they, they've come back for 10 years. Um, I guess I just don't get Voyage and the YWCA because they just suddenly have appeared. And we had a huge discussion for years back about uh, who we were going to have. We were going to very, be very, a very limited focus for economic development. Would you like me to comment yeah, on, could on you those help two me specifically? Understand that? Sure. Could I, could sure. I come in on the same thing before you do? Because I had the same thought. It just seems to, uh, the, you had the three, and then we added the fourth with, with the CIE. And then every, I, I guess I start to look at things and go, okay, now I get Genesis Block like Margaret said, but the rest seem to fall under, are we going to get, you know, if, if we're going to look at festivals and different things, you know, are we suddenly, why doesn't the battle, you know, the triathlon or the battleship, why, why aren't, you know, they're big draws too. I'm, I'm trying to almost want to have two buckets. In other words, you know, I, I don't, we're compared, they seems like apples and oranges. I'm not saying we don't help these people. I'm just saying we're starting to muddy it up and confuse what this is um i'm trying to figure out kind of why like a as i understand voyage you know some of these some of the other programs that are run by link you know their employment you know they're why are they in this pile and they're you know, in this in this bucket if that makes any sense right it, it does make sense and we, we've had some discussion internally on it, but specific to, to Voyage, uh, they, they have a program, a youth enrichment program, where they do some workforce development type work within this program to um, train and, and upskill youth teenagers to, for placement into summer jobs. So that, that technically met the criteria no. that we have for workforce development. And then YWCA has a, a program where uh, they, they have folks that are uh, members or, or come to YWCA for um, 
really entrepreneurial support services. If, if there's somebody who has a, a side uh, project, uh, side, side hustle, as, as I hear all the time, um, they, YWCA has, has folks on staff that will help them formalize their business. So if they're, they're cutting hair or selling something on, online, YWCA will help them form an LLC. They'll help them um, basically legitimize their business, taking it kind of from um, a neighborhood economy to the mainstream economy. Well, I think that's what Genesis Block is doing now, and I was a great proponent when they, they had a new director of the YWCA who had done this program in other areas. I'm not sure how successful it has been since she has, has left and gone on to, to greater things. I don't know who made the decision to move beyond WBD, the Film Commission, WDI. WBD and the Film Commission bring outside businesses in here to create jobs. WBD just showed us they created a thousand new jobs with these four entities. That to me is what economic development is. You wanna do job training, that's somewhere else. These people are already here. They're, we're just trying to get them up to speed to participate you know, on an even playing field. So to me, I don't know who made this decision, but I don't agree with it. I, I think we should go back to having the basic economic development organizations. Now, UNCW, the CIE, I don't know about them, you know, who knows? I mean, they, they have vacillated over the years. Um, it, I don't know, maybe job training, and, and that kind of thing, that to me is not economic development. We're trying to get these people up to speed to put them in already existing jobs to make them competitive in the workplace. Economic development is going outside and bringing in new opportunities. That, that's my definition, I don't know. I guess I, would, I guess I would suggest you know, I don't know if we can do it in, in this cycle, but in our next cycle, between now and then, we revisit this because, I mean, you are, if you're talking about Voyage, I mean, I don't see the difference. You know, we have programs with what uh, used to be Phoenix, and I don't know the new, whatever their new name, you know, new name is now. You know, I mean, they're finding jobs. You know, they're, you know, okay, you got the link programs, people coming out of incarceration, helping them get in the, that's, those are similar things. They're not as what Margaret uh, went to. And, and maybe as we get into it, there's three buckets, you know, attractions, uh, and, and we consider that. But I think it is starting to creep pretty bad, and uh, we need to, if we're going to say it's economic development, it needs to have a, a job number. Uh, he, that needs to be heavily weighted uh, is the job number is what we're after. Let, let me... I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, let me interrupt. I'm going to take Aubrey off the hot seat here because he and I have had this discussion. Um, and, and my response, uh, Mr. Anderson, was the same as yours, which is let's go through this process and let's change this afterwards. Clearly, WBD, WDI, and the Film Commission are three completely different entities. And in my estimation, they should not even be going through this process. They should be paid as a part of the budget because they are an arm of the city that does things that do not, that the city does not do. But we got into this process and we had the organizational creep, which you are, are, have already acknowledged, the job, the job training, those kinds of things are somewhat economically development oriented, but not as directly. And so what I had told Aubrey, and, and Aubrey disagreed with me, so I want you to know, you can take him off the hot seat, was that we needed to go ahead, and I told him we needed to go ahead with this process, and then we would investigate pulling those three out, uh, and then using this process to uh, look more for job creation, or excuse me, job development than job creation. And that was the intention. So you were right, and I was wrong. Um, <laughs> But that, that is the intention once we go forward from here. May I say something? Because there is a little history here. Uh, number one, uh, and the reason that those three organizations are under the hot seat, we, we had council members that were justifying the job creation yes, from sir. those individual yes, sir. organizations. 
So yes, that sir. was the reason that we put them through this process. Yes, and I sir. agree with Tony, we shouldn't even be here, but we had council members that specifically said, I want them to report and I want them to tell us exactly how many jobs they're creating. And that's the reason we went there. The other part of this, and I think everybody will remember this, is that we have a lot of nonprofits that have been using the moniker of economic development. Right. So that's why we're in a position that Aubrey's in right now because we've had so many of these organizations that have come up to us under the flag of nonprofits, but we're an economic development portion of it too. So that's why we're getting into diving into the weeds on these organizations. And this has been going on now for the last three to four years because they've been hearing us up here talking about economic development and jobs, and they've been coming here asking for money from the city with the flag saying we're an economic development organization also. So I just want to make sure everybody understands the context as to where we have found ourselves in. I think one thing, uh, to, to go back to what the city manager said, I think we should decide as a body, and maybe not today, but we should decide as a body that the three-legged stool, WBD, the Film Commission, and WDI are contractually committed to the city rather than through this competitive process because they are different from job creation and community support and all of that stuff. So I would like to see us consider that. I don't know what the process is, but I, th I think we should consider changing that. And, and we can certainly take that as feedback from today's session and in your final budget. Those three will be pulled out and put under the economic development function. And Mr. Mayor, you're absolutely right. The reason we did this was because we did have a uh, disagreement uh, among how these things ought to be funded. And we will be going back to the old way of funding them, but we, we do believe they are entirely different than the rest of them. Then we can bring the rest of the organizations forward for your review and, and comment. So these ones that are Voyage, YWCA, CIE, that are quasi-economic development, are we, are we talking about pulling those out here? I, no. I, I, think, I think more importantly, we're talking about pulling WDI, WBD, and the Film Commission out of this pot, taking with them the money that would go, and then leaving the remaining portion of that pot for job uh, uh, development, not necessarily not job, job creation. Yeah, jo job training, <laughs> job development, not, not job creation. So it's not really economic development then at that point? I, I think one could argue that, yes, sir. Well, I think that's the different bucket that Neil was talking about. They're not, I mean, they're not economic developers. I mean, the, the, the Employment Security Commission that the state runs is not a, an economic developer. They're helping people get jobs. Uh, but, but they do, I, I agree with you, but they do provide job training in the community, especially outreach into underserved communities and into underserved populations. And I think that's uh, an important function as well. That, that would fall under human, I'm a new guy here, but that would fall under human services. Would I mean, that's really training people up to, to go into the workforce. And we already have a, a, a category for that. Um, I, don't, I, I hate to take our eye off the ball on economic development when we got a full head of steam coming through here. There's probably some other organizations that are, would not just hold the flag, but would carry the banner. It's, it's not like we're showing them the door. I mean, there are other ways, as you alluded to earlier, that there are other programs and other funding sources. Right. But I mean, it either is or it isn't an economic developer. And the three that the mayor well, just talked about pulling out, those historically are economic developers. Those are our choices, the people that we deal with to do that for us. Anyway, it's a, I think what the mayor said is true. A lot of people, you know, they, they attach that to it because it thinks it gives them a, you know, more credibility with us. But at this point, we are either going to reformulate this here on the dais, or we're going to, which I don't think we're going to do. So we, we just need to move forward with looking at it differently. I guess next time, is that what you're proposing, Tony? I'm proposing that we go ahead and pull those three out, fund those directly out of the economic development function, to leave the remaining pot okay. for, those for those functions that are up there. If council wants to do away with them, wants to go ahead and fund them and modify it next time, 
However you want to deal with the rest of those organizations, I think would probably be better handled next time. So would you just move that that money and just call them all agency for now? Is we, that what we, you're kind of proposing? We would fund it again under the economic development function in the budget. Oh, you and would. it would be a line item for each each of those. I'm of talking those. about the ones that other than the three. You yes. would just move them into agency, move the, the funds and them into agency or no? We would treat them under the competitive process. With the other agencies that are, are not like uh, Link or all the other ones in the other? Yes, sir. Okay. With the other ones that have filed applications. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. So we can, uh, if, if I'm understanding correctly, of the $566,000 budget we have for this program, what we do is displace the recommendation with council's approval on the, the funding levels for the three organizations that, that we've gone through, WBD, Film, and WDI. And just quickly reviewing staff, staff's recommendations for each of those, uh, WBD and Film Commission uh, requested modest increases from their, their last go around. And um, given, given our scoring criteria, they, they came out um, on top and, and thus got a recommendation for full funding um, versus their request. WDI requested $140,000, and staff's recommendation was for $100,000 of that to be funded. Reason being, 40 of that 100 was for a one time study, a market study of, of downtown. And uh, given the, the funding constraints we have, we just thought that would be better um, and, and, yeah, that would be better uh, placed elsewhere in the budget as, aside from a, a, an award that would compound um, annually as they went to submit re-requests, if that makes sense. Okay, I agree with that. Uh, for the record, I am a director on WDI, DBA and the um, Thalian Hall Center for Performing Arts. But that you, j you just said what I felt like needed to be said, that that was a one-time thing for a retail study that's, that some of us believe is important, hasn't been done for like 20 years. So that's a one-time thing. So what I hear you saying is maybe that's somewhere else in the budget? Yes, we, we can work with WDI to present council with a proposal on, on potentially where else in, in the budget that that might um, fit, and we can, if the manager is comfortable with that, proceed with, with that in mind. Great, thank you. So that, that takes roughly 60% of the, the budget out of the 566. Um, so if, if, if council wishes, I can review the, the remainder of the recommendations that would relate to the remaining agencies that met the criteria uh, and, and whose applications staff reviewed, or um, if it, if, if council's wishes, we can reformulate the presentation and, and, and come back with um, come back with a, a reformatted presentation of recommendations. Why don't you do that? Okay. Thank you. And it, and, <laughs> right, and also in the process. Um, I noticed Genesis Block, did they ask for 125000 Yes, per year. And, and we only gave them 25000 Yes, sir. Um, because? There just simply wasn't the funding to reward everybody, um, their, the entirety of their requests. Genesis Block uh, submitted an application that required some follow-up questions from staff on exactly how the money would be spent and, and where. And we, we received some answers to that, but um, not, um, not all of the, the information that, that we'd hoped to receive. Uh, okay. They're still um, obviously a, a relatively new entity in town. They did receive one-time funding from the city. Uh, the county is funding them at a $25,000 level. And the... Um, while, they're, while, they, while they scored well in the criteria for workforce development and um, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and a number of other factors, it was just a, a very large ask for a new entrant. And given the budget constraints, there was um, only, only so much we could do there. Mm -hmm. All right. So with that, I think we'll uh, work up a new set of slides on, on these agencies, excluding the three that, that have already been discussed, discussed, and we'll present that to council here uh, when we're ready. Okay. Thank you. Thank you,
Thank you, Dylan. Hello, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, Council. Um, as many of you are aware, um, in addition to the economic development process, there's um, a human services competitive process. Um, in the past, it may have also been called public service um, process or outside agency process, but um, the same. So the purpose of, of, of this particular process is to fund uh, community agencies who provide services to marginalized uh, members of our community. So the services benefit low to moderate income persons, and that's um, programs that serve youth, homeless, victims of abuse, uh, food insecurity, on those in need of housing repair to prevent displacement from their housing, and job um, training and placement for low to moderate income uh, folks to help them uh, succeed in, in the workforce. This um, funding is on a two-year cycle. The economic development process that Aubrey just talked about is on a three-year cycle, um, but occasionally, like this year, the cycles come together, and that may cause a little confusion in the community. Um, so we began the two-year process with um, advertisements and press releases that went out in early December. We maintain a database of obviously all the previous um, recipients and anyone who calls and inquires about the program, you know, off, off cycle, we keep a database and we do a direct email to those folks as well uh, as working with the city communications to get the word out. We have uh, mandatory workshops uh, for folks who are going to apply so that they, we can go through the guidelines and the process and, and um, answer any questions they have. So we held two virtual workshops in uh, December and early January and we were also available for one-on-one -on -one consultations if folks couldn't make those workshops. The applications were due January 18th, <clears throat> and um, then we have a staff review panel um, consisting of staff from finance, community development and housing, uh, and Tony McEwen, who is his own special staff. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, uh, who, who sat on the review panel, and applicants have the opportunity, um, if they choose, to, for an interview. And I believe every applicant chose an interview, so that's like a 20-minute or so virtual interview. So um, it is an involved process, but it gives us a chance to get clarification on any questions in the application. and and to, to meet the applicants and maybe understand a little bit better what they're doing. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the uh, intake and evaluation process. Um, Aubrey showed you some comparisons uh, to, to the county and we've pulled together from the county budget records some comparisons on our human service uh, grants with what the county has done. You can see um, we track um, pretty close to them, but the county does have a little bit bigger budget. The second uh, set of, of, uh, of graphs to the right is, includes what CDBG. Because as you know, we have a 10% of our CDBG award that can go towards public services. Suzanne, to be fair to the county and, and, and to get a really clear picture on this, I understand that 80% of the county's budget or even higher may be already earmarked by the state government. They're an extension of state government in regard to social services. Is that correct? So a lot of money is sent from the state to the county governments to help on a lot of the social servicing programming. This is in addition to that by the county going into their general fund to fund some of these human services grant funding. That is correct. Do we know the total amount of funding that the county receives from the state government in Raleigh for social services? 
I don't have that information, sir. We could find that in their budget. I think it would be very it. important for this community and for this city to understand how much money they receive, how much money they allocate for social servicing programming in addition to what they are doing out of their general fund. I think it gives us a clearer picture of where they are and where, and where we kind of fill in the gaps by helping them in some of these programs. Yes, Would that sir. be a fair assessment? Yes. I just like to have a, a much clearer picture of that because I don't believe a lot of people do understand, and I understand if you're not in civics and you don't study these forms of government and how these governments were created by the state governments, you don't get a clear picture. So a lot of the social programming comes to us asking us for the help where the vast majority of that money is going to the county for social servicing programming. And there just seems to be a disconnect at times. And we have a very sh small portion of our budget that goes towards social programming, which I'm for. But I also want to know the total impact that both city and county governments are having on social programming because there's a, there's a disconnect between advocacy groups that don't believe we're doing nothing and what we are currently doing between the city and county governments, which I believe is pretty significant. Is that a fair st statement? Yes, sir. If you look at these numbers, there's a significant investment from local government beyond the uh, mandated okay. uh, services. And I believe the county budget would have the information that you're looking for, so we'll pull that out. Because I don't think it's it. being fair to the county government, because I don't think people understand exactly what they do do, and they do a lot in social programming, and it's a tune of millions of millions of dollars. And I think that we have a right to understand exactly what, how that intermeshes with us uh, and we all try to work together to try to have the greatest impact in the community. But I think there's a significant amount of money that is going, plus the fact moving forward, hopefully with this foundation, the impacts they will have in addition to what the county and the city governments are doing, as well as what the foundation will be doing with that money they receive from the sale of the hospital. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get that for you. Um, so in terms of the funding requests that we received this cycle, we received uh, 38 applications and we receive applications uh, for programs. So it's possible that an organization, an agency could submit more than one application. So we had 35 agencies applying, 38 programs. 10 of those agencies were or new to the process and they requested about 1.4 million. Um, this is a comparison of our, our current year budget with um, FY23 request. And um, you can see in terms of total applications, an uh, increase from 34 to 38. Uh, new applications, the same. And um, a funding gap uh, that is, as always, significant between what, what the budget amount is and, and what's uh, requested. You'll recall back in um, early in the year, we brought some changes to the process forward and uh, we had, and you approved uh, a maximum per program of 50,000, a minimum of 10,000 and no more than 75,000 per organization. So that would apply if organizations had more than one program. They would be limited to 75,000 total. So that went into effect in, in this round. We um, use a scoring process to um, try to be as objective as possible and treat everyone the same. Uh, so it's possible. The maximum score is 170. You would have to be meeting every focus area and everything, so it's, we won't have anyone at 170, but that's the maximum. And then you have, see here a list of the, of the categories that we're scoring in. Um, so um, many of these things are really, did you provide the information or not? So you either get the points or you don't get the points in um, agency applicant information as an example. So we asked them to provide us their tax termination letter, um, their audit, um, their procurement policies, things like that. There's a whole list of things. And then the, you get two points for the document or you don't. So that's pretty straightforward. 
experience and capacity. We're looking at do they have at least one year experience operating the program? Uh, do they have uh, trained, experienced staff and the capacity to sustain the project? Things like that. Um, the program overview is where we're looking at um, sort of the, the focus area. So are they addressing um, lowering the risk of youth violence, improving economic conditions through job training and job life skills training and things like that, providing a safe haven for vulnerable citizens, so um, your domestic violence and safe haven places like that, preventing um, displacement of, how, of or loss of housing, so warm, things like that, increasing access to healthy, nutritious meals, and, ser and finally serving low to moderate income clientele, um, which is a requirement in, in this particular uh, program. Uh, then we, we added diversity, equity, and inclusion this year, um, looking at the organization's board and staff and how they reflect the community they serve, looking at the um, availability of the program throughout the community and um, if the organization is inclusive in inviting contribution, partnership, and participation from the communities that they serve. So that gets a little more subjective, but um, we had some questions in the application to get at that. Then we look at budget and financial management. Is the budget reasonable and realistic uh, compared to similar organizations? Is it complete and accurate? Do they provide all the information we ask for? Uh, do they have good leveraging and other funding sources? So um, we're um, asking them not to submit a request for more than 35% of their program budget. So the city is not you know, the majority funder, the majority supporter for any of these organizations. And then audit or financial findings in their, in their reports. Then we look at their work plan, uh, their goals and objectives, if they're clear, realistic, things like that. And then, of course, we changed the way we look at past performance so that we didn't um, penalize new agencies. <clears throat> so that's that process and part of what happens in those interviews. So you have a handout and, um, that I think totals this. We, we took all the um, agencies, scored them, and ranked them, and then broke them down into tiers. And uh, the first tier is presented on this slide, and that was anyone that were, um, scored from 136 to 139. And we are recommending that they are funded at 95% of their request. So that for this group is $230,850. So I, I guess that just begs a question. So when someone hears that, I mean, next time you just make a bigger request and you get 90%, I'm trying to... Sorry. You said you, rec you recommended you get 90% of whatever their request was. So if their request was 100000 they get 90 I'm trying to... Well, I they could not request 50. more than 50000 right. per program. Okay, right. but it, I'm just wondering how you came to the idea that whatever they requested, they get 90 Well, we came to that once we saw all the scores and we saw what our budget was, and then we were trying to, you know, make an allocation within, and I'm sure you all can understand this, within the resources that we have. And so the higher you score, the more of your request you're, you're going to get. I guess that's what I was thinking. You know, it's qualitative is the purpose of it, that somebody that scores higher might get 95 and somebody that scores lower might get 75. Exactly. But, but you're saying everybody got 90. No, no. I'm saying, I'm saying <laughs> in this tier of the, out of the 35 oh, okay. applications My fault. we have. My fault. Go ahead. This group scored the highest, and they're, and they're getting 95% of their request. This group scored the second <laughs> highest, this tier, which is from 130 to 135, the scores you'll see. 
and we're recommending that they get 75% of their request. This group um, was in the third tier from 120 to 129, uh, and we recommend that they get 55% of their request. And then finally, um, the group that scored the lowest from 100 up to 119, um, we recommend that they get $12,000 because, um, you know, at this point, that's what we have left. And you'll see the exception there is um, community enrichment. They asked for 10 and we're recommending 10, which would be the minimum, but that's all they ask for. So that is the um, utilization of our budget with $1,483 left over. I, uh, I appreciate the, the tears. Uh, I think that it that helps me to really understand um, why certain groups receive a certain amount. So that, that was really helpful. I appreciate that. So um, as Aubrey mentioned, we, we did have some discussions about agencies that had applied in both of the uh, processes, and um, we determined, uh, uh, staff, that the YWCA's Economic Empowerment Program might fit better with the um, economic development. We also had some applicants that we could fund through other sources, CDBG or CHODO federal funds. That would be First Fruit, Domestic Violence, and the um, Cape Fear Community Land Trust. So we pulled those out. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Suzanne, so are you saying that the why here, this is in addition to the 40,000 that, that Aubrey showed us? We, for the we, YWCA? Well, what I'm saying, um, or trying to explain it, bear with me, is the why did apply to both programs. And so Aubrey and I met and talked about, as well as Voyage applied to both programs. Those were our two overlaps. So we are basically referring the WISE application to the economic development program and saying it should be funded out of that pot of money and we're not recommending funding it out of this pot of money. Um, and then <clears throat> he's referring Voyage to this pot of money and we're saying we'll, we'll fund Voyage out of this pot of money. Okay, I think we just talked about changing the economic development pot in some way. So uh, uh, what you're saying is they wouldn't get this 45, they would get the other 40? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, 95 seems a stretch, so I <laughs> just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Yes, yes, that's exactly what, what we're proposing. Um, we had two applicants that did not score above uh, 100, which was the uh, the breaking point, so we're not recommending funding for comprehensive care with independent works or bread for life food pantry. Not any reflection on the work they do, but that's how they came out in the scoring. Then we had three agencies that, again, are doing great work, but they did not meet any of the focus areas. And that's Canines for Service, Blank Canvas Art, and accessible coastal Carolina events and sports services. Suzanne, you, you, uh, all of these in the tiers, and, and I tried to review this before the today's meeting. These all uh, help individuals, children, adults, what have you. There's one on here that, and this council sits here Tuesday night after Tuesday night. And, and gives the city permission to tear down a house because it's fallen into such disrepair and can't be saved. Warm is just such a, a, a ministry, in my opinion, that they prevent an awful lot of that. Yes, People that can't come down here, they can't, for some reason, whatever or another, don't qualify for some of our health programs. And they're the people that are near and dear to my heart. They need help. And this group goes out and puts porches on, finishes floors, puts roofs on. And 
I see what they asked for, and they scored 126. They were a couple of points away from getting more. Uh, when, when the time comes, I would certainly, where I sit by myself, I'd certainly like to see that increased. They do a wonderful job and prevent a lot of those very houses that we have to condemn from getting to that status. Absolutely. Thank you, ma'am. I had the exact same question, actually, just knowing, seeing what, what Warm has done it, in our community uh, firsthand, like everybody else up here. But um, did they request more than they have in the past that we've, I mean, do we have historical data from the last time that they requested, and did, did they score lower than they had in the past? I'd have to look back and see their scoring in the past. Um, they received. So be, um, it just would be interesting to see what dropped them down. Yeah, I can. Um, let's see. I have some notes. And, and you can send it later. I mean, I don't have to see it right now, but okay. that, that would be something interesting for to, to see. Yeah, I believe there was some some confusion, some items in their budget that we couldn't quite understand why they had some items at the level that they had them. Um, but I can send you those details. I'm happy to, to send you that in their scoring sheet. Um, so they received in the current year 42,753. Um, yeah, so, so they, we, they we will be, this would be a decrease. Cut it them. about in half. Yeah. Okay. Suzanne. Good. Yeah. So when, um, like, for example, with this organization, when they get the decrease, do we talk to them about why and, and the reason why we were suggesting this amount instead of what you requested? Do we do any kind of follow-up? That's what I'm asking. Yes. Okay. And so I'm saying that, too, but the same with um, the two groups that didn't meet the criteria. We do, like, the group that was scored under 100. I mean, if you're using the, the Rubik's, Thing, then I think it's, that's fair. Um, but I just I hope that we get an opportunity to really help them to understand why they didn't get what they were requesting and what they may need to do to be better prepared for the next time around. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. We will provide that information and, and technical assistance. Um, okay. Suzanne? And we try to, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Finish Anderson. your statement. I'll, I'll wait. Oh. In, in past years, the recommendation has been based on maybe a percentage of or an increase over what they received before, but I'm um, trying to be in line with council's wishes not to be not to penalize new applicants. The recommendations this year are just based on their request, as I've described here. So that is a, a little bit of a change. Okay, or maybe a lot. Could we just take one line, uh, maybe? Uh, everyone else may be understand it, but I'm, I'm missing something. Like, look at uh, just just take Link for example, because it has a lot of numbers. So we can talk about. Uh, we got the that's the the first column is the CARES, which was the first the first funds from um, COVID money, right? CARES Act money is that what that that yes, that is the care um, CARES Act money that came through um, the CDBG right. program. That was early on in the pandemic. Right. And then the ARP is the second like second tranche of that that they did later, right? Yes, correct. What is GFRTI? And then last budget season, you all did some um, Rise Together initiative, general fund, one-time funding. That's what that column represents. Okay, so then the next number in that case the 78 represent what is that the to is a total of or was that just the city's funds that is the that is the city's general fund um award to them through the last cycle so that would have happened actually prior to the first three columns so it got cut you you're recommending cutting that in half then Am I following um, you? Yes, sir. Well, yes. So they must have had a bad year. Well, 
So part of it is with a maximum of 50,000 per program that automatically reduced what they would be able to receive in this process. Um, they actually scored in the second tier, so they got 75% of, of, of the maximum that they could receive for a program, and that's the 37.5. But yeah, it, does, just really it, it has an impact on them. Clarify the math of all those numbers, because nothing adds up to No, they, <laughs> you, you, they don't they, add up. It's nothing just, adds up, so I was a bit confused. On the, at some point, could you uh, send us a little blurb on, um, and if you have, I, I, I missed it. I apologize, but on the new folks that you're the new folks you're proposing to um, to fund, recommending, just so I can learn more about each of them. Uh, count six of them. Is that about right? That seems about right. That'd be great. Yes, sir. I'll send you a little program. To yeah, thank description. you. Description. I believe um, you had in your January meeting a program a little Is it in there? summary. Okay, so well, I'll go, I can go back. But I'll, I'll get that and send it back out for all, all of them. I, I just say one thing uh, uh, as an overview. I think you, you've done exactly what we have asked you to do in sort of tweaking the way you do it, and I think the matrix that you've come up with in the scoring process is excellent. And you had a number of people. This is not one person. We all have organizations that we think are doing a great job, but I think we ought to stick with, with what generally we've asked you to do and with the process that you've done and not start cherry picking different organizations out of there. We all have some and we all agree on some of them that are that are doing good work but you either have a process and a matrix and an organization, a group and everybody follow, I'm a rule follower. Everybody follows the rules and the, the chips fall where they may. And so I, I just want to congratulate you on doing this a lot of work. So I, I think it's a good result. Thank you. And I, I agree with uh, Mayor Pro Tem because um, I can look at all these organizations and say, yeah, they're one point, two points from the next level. And I'd love to see them go there. But if we've got the matrix, you know, and that's why I'm saying the main thing I hope that we do is we do the follow up to say to this organization, man, you could have gotten. 100% if you had done X, Y, Z. Yeah. That's all. Thank you. Yes, and, and we, we will do that follow-up and recommend them to um, Kino, which is at the university that provides uh, more specific training for, for nonprofits. Zen, when did the, I, I assume, remind me, I guess, at, during this time last year or two years ago or three, whenever, we, that's when we came up with the 50,000? The 50,000 max? Mm -hmm. We were asked to take a look at our process and ensure that we weren't inadvertently biasing um, the, big guys. the mm -hmm. agencies who had always been funded. And we were doing some things that probably did give them a little bit of a leg up. So that's when we came to you and said, we, we recommend these changes. And one of them was the 50,000 max. Um, knowing that, you know, there is a limited budget and believing that the council's desire was for agencies who had not been funded in the past to be able to compete better than they had. Okay, thank you. So that was, that was the logic. Um, we also have some agencies um, that submitted requests that really don't fit in the competitive agency um, process, and that would be the continuum of care that is uh, run through the Cape Fear Council of Governments. The city has um, funded for a number of years the continuum of care or its predecessor, the 10-year plan to end homelessness, which was at United Way. Um, so there were some changes in federal legislation maybe five years ago called the Hearth Act that required the homeless services folks to become more formal and create a continuum of care that was staffed and a coordinated entry process so that uh, folks who are receiving homeless services and shelter come through 
one sort of assessment and then get referred to various services. And so that's essentially what the continuum of care is responsible for and they are required by HUD so that the community can receive about $900,000 in other federal funds specifically for housing. So um, the city had a, a contract uh, with them, an agreement to fund them at $50,000 a year for five years and that period has ended and they are requesting an increase to $65,000. They also receive funding from the county, New Hanover County at 27,000 and Brunswick and Pender County at about 5150 um, each, at least that was what they received in the I have current a question year. on that. Did, have they requested an increase from both the county and from Brunswick and Pender as well? Do we know what those percentage increases are? Because our, our percentage increases, I mean, we're at, we have 30% requested increase and we already fund like 85% above the New Hanover County uh, allocation which I'm sure is you know partly due to what this, the mayor brought up earlier but do we have any idea on, on that? I have had discussions with them um, and, and asked that question and they said yes they have asked for an increase but I, they do not know yet if they will receive that. But they've yes. asked all, all of their county partners as Mr. well. Mr. Robin Mark has a question. That's true. I, I serve on, I'm, uh, my question, first of all, uh, Mr. Joy, this is one that I am uh, I'm on the executive board at, at COG. Is this, is this one of the things that I'm not uh, able to dive in on? Council of Governments was formed by the local governments themselves. Is that correct, Councilmember Ravenbar? It, it was actually formed by state statute, John. Thank you. Okay, then... Yes, the, you are allowed to because it was formed by the state. Okay. Therefore, you, you were correct in your answer to they have applied uh, to these other two, three agencies for a funding increase. But the city of Wilmington has always been the the, the lion's share uh, of, and a lot of the com communities that we serve are not in a position to pay anything, and it's. Uh, Anyway, that's, that's the answer to that, if that helps. And I don't know what their outcome is going to be with those other governments, but I'll find out and I'll get to you. <clears throat> that is all the information I have for you all. Thank you, Any Suzanne. questions? Thank you all. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, we are now going to proceed to uh, give you an update on our market analysis with regard to retention. Uh, Clayton Roberts is going to do that for us. Uh, Mr. Raglan is indisposed this morning, uh, is listening in, but indisposed this morning. Uh, so Clayton is going to present that. I, I want to uh, just uh, remind you that this is going to be uh, kind of eye-opening. There are a number of positions that have changed dramatically and that it's going to have a dramatic impact on uh, our ability to retain folks. We are already having that, that very difficult situation, not only at the entry levels of the position, but the upper levels of the organization. And this is our number one priority in terms of both council and staff in development of the budget. So I'd just like to present that uh, for your consideration as Clayton proceeds forward. Thanks, Clayton. Thank you, Tony. Good morning, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of City Council. I appreciate the opportunity to provide you all with an update on the market study after receiving your feedback at your last January uh, work session. I want to start out by talking about inflation trends. Um, since December, inflation has continued to rise from 7% to now almost 8%. Experts are predicting that inflation will continue to grow with recent spikes in uh, gas and utilities. But while we're seeing some leveling off of gas prices, um, we're seeing the cost of other items continue to go up. And all of this has an impact on the average consumer purchasing power. Um, this is something just for us to keep an eye on as we continue to um, review employee compensation and make recommendations going forward. Um, looking at the city of Wilmington salary scales, um, our hourly salary scales and starting pay have remained the same since 2018, except for those making less than $15 an hour. Um, Thanks to council, we just bumped those employees up to $15 an hour in January. That impacted roughly 80 employees. Um, our exempt ranges have not moved since 2015. 
Um, while employees have still been able to move through the ranges um, due to merit increases uh, that council has authorized, uh, these increases have not been keeping up with um, recent inflation that we've seen over the last year. So as we've been trying to recruit um, over the last several months, many applicants have been countering their offers or accepting higher offers um, with other organizations as they're now expecting uh, to earn more uh, at the ranges than what we offer here at the city currently. Um, it's been difficult for us to negotiate and accept the rate with many new hires based on our budget restraints. So because of rising wages and increased competition, uh, some of our benchmarks have already been making changes. Uh, the city of Raleigh has recently proposed adjusting its wage scales. Durham uh, provided mid-year adjustments uh, in January. Winston-Salem also in January. Fayetteville made further adjustments to their police salaries in January. And Asheville recently implemented a $7.8 million pay adjustment as well in January. So looking at the city of Wilmington and our turnover, um, we saw a significant increase in turnover in FY21, um, which was 15.5%, which is our highest in five years. Um, however, we are already at 9.3% 9, 9 just in the first six months of this fiscal year. So on this trajectory, uh, we'll be around 18% if we stay on this trend. I have a quick question on that graph. Do we know for fiscal year 2017 through like 2020 where we were at in this up to the second quarter? Do we have any sort of indication on what the percentage of turnover was? It's generally about half. half of what about half here. of what we see is yes, the general sir. average. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. And Clayton, would, um, could you say much of this turnover is due to COVID? Uh, it could be, yes. People have been really evaluating their circumstances and just reevaluating their priorities, and some people are just making a complete change. And mm -hmm. I was just talking to our... Um, uh, one of our firefighter uh, recruiters who said basically this is the first class he's seen where he's it's not people that are coming to us fresh wanting to be firefighters these are people that had other careers and they've just evaluated life and they want to do something that's meaningful so we've got people coming to us from all different careers thank you. so um why are people leaving going into your question councilman uh, barnett um uh, turnover is high. Uh, you can see looking at the pie graph on the right that 75.8% are leaving voluntarily for other career, careers, career advancement, family reasons. We have some examples where people have had to relocate closer to family, where they have child care because those costs are also rising. Um, it's important to note um, that this is not just a city of Wilmington problem. Um, companies are finding it extremely difficult to find uh, and hire new employees everywhere. Um, and so 4 million people quit their jobs alone in January, and that's nationwide. So companies across the state of North Carolina having to play offense, defense, uh, as we try to uh, retain employees and attract employees at the same time. Um, unemployment at this time is at 3.9%, which is back to its pre-pandemic levels. Um, but however, labor participation rates are down as baby boomers retire. There's not enough workers to, fall, to fill those, those gaps. So what does the city of Wilmington look like currently in terms of our vacancies? Um, you can see looking at our vacancies across the organization, the data was pulled at the beginning of, of, the, la of the most recent pay period, which was Monday. And this number is very fluid. It's already changed since uh, we pulled this data uh, with new resignations and people coming on board. But you can see 129 vacancies across the organization uh, with most of our vacancies in police, public services, and community services. Um, in addition to the vacancies, you've got to take into consideration we have uh, 48 employees that are on FMLA. They're also out. So technically, that's about 177 vacancies, or around 15% of our budgeted positions are unfilled. And all these vacancies are creating more work for staff that are left remaining, um, which is leading to burnout in many parts of our organization. So in filling these vacancies Excuse has been me, very challenging. Got a question. Yes, sir. In, in this, what, what are the five positions in the city manager's office, Tony, or whatever? There, there are two deputy city manager positions open. Uh, Tony McEwen's position is open. There's a part-time position in the DE&I office. Uh, oh, and the uh, uh, assistant to the city manager uh, position that was vacated by Ayers Dunstan. What is Aubrey doing? Aubrey is doing a portion of Eris' uh, responsibilities with regard to economic development. Chance Dunsbar is carrying that uh, load on the other side for the downtown portion of that. That may be what we wind up doing uh, in the long term, but that is, that is fluid right now. So we've got two, city, two deputy city managers coming. 
DEI. And Tony McEwen's position. And Eris's. And Eris's, yes, sir. Thank you. Sir. But, I mean, to be fair, two of those are newly created positions, right? I mean, or one. Two of, them are, two, of, two of them are newly created. One of them is a DCM position, the other one is the uh, DEI position that was created this. And are you having a hard time getting people to apply for the deputy city manager job? No, sir, I'm just having trouble making time to, to fit it all in right now, trying to get it off my desk. I can understand that. But, but we are. We but are, I'm just curious. I mean, is that. No, we, we had 171 applications for those positions. Okay. Uh, All right. 75 of which were uh, were qualified. So uh, we're we're coming to the short rows on that one. Okay, great. So so the, the the what I can draw from that is the upper level is not having near the, the the problems that police, fire, community services are having. Uh, correct. And, and at, at the executive level, you're you're correct. Uh, and and the, Clayton, the Clayton will address this more closely, but I, I will say as a percentage of the department. It's probably as almost equally as, as impactful, but the disparity with regard to pay and pay increases and, and pay ranges is much less than at the entry level of public safety. Yes. Say that again, Tony. I didn't understand that. As a percentage of the city manager's office, five people is probably as great as um, uh, 31, or excuse me, 35 people in the police department. As a percentage of the department it's probably very close to being equal. But in terms of disparity of pay, the pay ranges in the city manager's office are much closer to being market value than are the police and I fire get, and get public that. services. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. In respect to the police, I knew there were 35 vacancies. I understood a portion of those vacancies had been filled. Is, is, this we've, the, we've got, is this the updated number? It is. We've got some people in, in training, and so okay. it takes us some time to get them trained out of the LET and onto the force. Okay, and this is the first time I've ever seen that kind of disparity, I mean, that kind of number for the fire. So yeah. do we have a, we have a fire uh, um, class now? I mean, we do. Fire Good class. news, we got 18 firefighters that we're going to be starting uh, next month, end of, end of April. Okay. Does, does that I'm sorry, Go Mayor. Ahead. Go ahead. Does that fire disparity follow up to your? Does that fire disparity have to do with the new uh, the, the new um, river lights? That I don't. Department. Wrong. That's not going to be until next. It, it does those not numbers. include the river so lights. These are existing department. Okay. Correct. Okay. And then in respect to public services, could you kind of give me a breakdown it's into public services? What what that why that numbers are so dramatically high, as well as community services. Right, and, and those are public services. It's going to be an RTS. We've got about five or six um, drivers that were down currently, um, and then you got stormwater. Several vacancies at the entry level, senior um, uh, stormwater worker and streets. You got a couple um, senior construction worker vacancies as well. Got a couple vacancies in buildings as well. Um, last Monday, our buildings facility superintendent submitted her resignation, and she had a technician that also submitted the resignation that same day. Uh, all for better uh, other opportunities outside the organization. Going into the private sector? Um, one's actually going, moving, again, looking at their lifestyle, going somewhere different, doing something different. Um, but another one is, is leaving for family reasons, going up north. Okay. Well, one, one final, just uh, curious. Of the vacancies that I see here, the 35, 31, 26, and so forth, is there, do, do you happen to have knowledge of which of those are new positions and which of those are because of turnover? I do not off the top of my head, no, sir. Okay. You mentioned 18 in somewhere in the pipeline for fire. Yes. And you mentioned there were some in the pipeline for police. What was? Do you know that number? I don't know that police, uh, the number for police. We just started Ballpark. an academy. Uh, they're going to hire another one for the summer. And, Chief, you want to? Dozen, two dozen. Answer that. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. To give you an update on police, where we're at, um, we have 19 actual police officer vacancies. I have 10 that are in the academy right now. I have 12 that are in field training, and I have another eight to nine that are out on injury leave, FMLA. So in essence, we're down about 50 bodies right now. Donnie, the, the, excuse me. Uh, the, I know that in, in policing has always been some vacancy number uh, that has always kind of been out there. Um, is this abnormally high, or is it about 
where we've seen in the past, what we this is high. We've we've seen this number before, but it's very rare that we're down 50 vacancies. This okay. this is detrimental, and I just want to say that our people have really stepped up to the plate this last year to work overtime, fill in extra assignments. They're resilient, but it's starting to catch up with them. They're starting to break down. They can't do this, but for so long. Okay. And chief, I mean, I know that you have a, a relationship with a lot of different chiefs around the state of North Carolina. This is where I would imagine that there's some communities and cities around the state that have a much higher vacancy than we do, and we're in probably in the middle of the pack or at the lower end of that range. Where, where do we, where do we, where, where do we rank in respect to, to cities around the, the state? The last time that I took a, a look, there were some agencies that have more vacancies than we do, and then there were some that have lower vacancies. It seems that your smaller agencies are not experiencing the vacancies that the larger agencies is. And what it comes down to, officers can go to work at smaller agencies and they don't have to work as hard. To give an example, um, from 6 o'clock yesterday morning to 6 o'clock this morning, your Wilmington police officers responded to 490 calls for service. There were over 300 on day shift and 170 something on night shift. Wow. Gotcha. And, and Chief, all of these, <clears throat> of the ones that you just mentioned, they're due to the usual suspects? What, what, are the, what, are the term, what, is, the, what is that number? The calls for service? No. The, the, vacancies. the, the vacancies. What, what, what is the number one contributing factor to that, that number? Well, compensation is one of the huge drivers because people can go to work at other cities and be compensated better. And some of it is folks are just getting out of um, policing due to the things that we've experienced the past two years. You know, across the board, not just police, but every, every department in our city, I hear that every time somebody steps up to the podium, it's because of compensation somewhere else. They can go across the river, they can go to Raleigh. You know, I mean, I don't understand that. And it's every year we do market studies, we get everybody up to snuff, and then the next year or two years later, they can go here, they can go there and get more money. Yes, our recruiters went to two recruiting events here in the past month or so, and we were the lowest um, agency there that was offering um, salaries for police officers at both events. Now, were we looking at just strictly what they take home in their, in their pay envelope, or were we looking at the package? The total um, package, we do offer a little more in deferred compensation, but our younger people, they're looking for the instant gratification. They're not Understood. looking to be in this thing for 30 years, some of them. To give an example, um, you just invested in a police officer that we hired in July. We sent her to BLET. She graduated BLET. She was sworn in in January. I was so proud she's already resigned and going to work for a federal agency. So we wasted all that money in sending that individual to BLET and salary and um, field training. You know, we, we had this conversation before, and I think it got shot down before we even got going on it, but there's got to be some kind of a, a pledge or I, I don't, I'm, something legally that we can do to compel these people, uh, you know, to stay uh, and, 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 and give us two or three or four years before they take off. I mean, we, we, this is insanity to keep doing what we're doing. We train these people. I don't know how much we spent. It's a great deal. It is. It's, and it's, it's, it's probably about $40,000, $50,000. And, and, and she's not the only one. It happens rather often, more often than, than, than's comfortable. But, and, and that's, a, that's a, a, a discussion for another day. I know that's not what we're talking about here today, but it just, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's crazy. Luke, well, I don't know if it is a discussion for another day. I, I, I think, I mean, you get honorable people coming to, to work for the police department. You know, they believe in and in, in serve their community. So even if it's not something that's, you know, legally binding them to a contract for a year or two years, signing their name to a piece of paper saying that they're going to commit to a place for, for a couple of years will mean something. Um, so I would certainly like to look into, uh, look into that. I mean, they're, they're swearing things and they're, and they're, and they're signing off. And while, you know, we may not hold their feet to the fire on it, it'll mean something to them. Um, and, and I think that, that we should look into that because if we could even decrease that turnover by a, you know, a marginal percentage, those are big dollars um, that we could then put back into that police department. I agree with that, and I think that that would be something for the legal department to to look at. You know, you don't get um, 
teachers, doctors, people that get, have federal money to help them go to school, then they have two or three or four years of service that they have to, or they have to pay back part of the money or a good part of the money. So I don't think it's, it's that unusual to try to do that. And we ought to get our salaries up and be competitive. I think we have to do that. We've talked about this over the last decade that I know of about running a training school for other organizations, and we've got to stop doing that. Uh, but I, I agree with Charlie and, and Luke. I do think we've got to come up with something that um, in, encourages them and, what do you say, hold their feet to the fire to, to either stick with us and be a good officer or to, to darn it, pay us back the money we spent on you to make you employable elsewhere. Right. It's nuts. Chief, are there any other communities around the state or the country that do something similar to what Councilor is discussing right there, now? There are some that have done it, and I don't know what the um, end result of it is if someone decides to leave, if it ends up being a drawn out court battle or, or what the deal is with them. Okay. Well, no, I don't think that would be something that we would have, you know, somebody takes a position or has a life change, you know, that, that is what it is. But I, my point was more that these are men and women that hold, hold honor to, to a higher probably regard than 90% of, uh, you know, the civilians out there. Um, and I think that just signing their name to a pledge, something that, that you know, is a contract that's maybe drawn up, but that, that's going to go a long way with at least half of the folks that would think about leaving. Wouldn't hurt. Or, Chief, I'm sorry, yeah, sorry, with, um, and you mentioned it slightly, you mentioned um, with the trend of what's happened in the last couple of years, um, a lot of people may not be going into the police force. Are you, are you seeing any changes? Are you seeing like more people wanting to come or are you seeing more people exiting? No, it's less people wanting to come and um, more people that are exiting. We've had so many retirements over the past um, two years. It's just been mind boggling. But with that, you do have a core group of employees that have been here with us for the long haul. And I just want to mention them because, again, they have given up a lot of sacrifice these past two years. Mm -hmm. They've missed baseball games. They've missed family commitments to serve our um, citizens. And I'm just proud of what they do each and every day. Yeah. It's a tough time, I think, to be a police officer. Yes, it is. And, yeah, we commend you guys. Thank you. Thank you. The, the, uh, you know, there's thinking outside the box, if there's any way that these people could have some skin in the game from day one, you know, helping pay for some of their own education or some of the training, and then give it back to them over the first year period of their employment or the, or the two years of their employment in equal installments, give it back to them. But this, I mean, that, that's, I know that was an extreme example you gave about the lady getting sworn in and a month later going, sometimes they, they do stay a year or whatever and then go, I, I assume. But you, and it's got to be terribly frustrating for you and the command staff and the, and the, the policemen on the, you know, somebody comes in when we raise the, when we get the raise up, then you have a compression issue, not just in the police department, but the fire department, you know, new guy comes in and the guy that's been there two or three years, he's making almost the same thing. So it, it, it's a domino effect going uphill. Fair statement? Yes, sir. Donnie. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Mr. Spears. I, I just, I don't know if we're listening to ourselves. I don't know if, we're, if we are actually listening to the words that are coming out of our mouth. But if we're talking about people who are in a position or potentially a bad position or, or looking for a career change, we're talking about them making an investment into a future, right? but a monetary investment into a future that you potentially get back? Because if a lot of people were in the position to make that investment, that financial investment into a, a new opportunity, they wouldn't be seeking that opportunity. They would be entrepreneurs. So we have to understand it's a little bit of a give and a take. I think, and this next question will be for Clayton, what are we gonna do differently to, to usher in new people and to get people to stay because there, there has to be some sort of an issue. And, and I'm not just saying with us, I'm saying with companies in general, as we look at HR practices and processes, 
we've got a bunch of people leaving jobs, but we also have a lot of people who are looking for jobs who aren't able to be employed, who aren't getting employed. And, and, and I, I don't think anybody fills out an application and deems themselves unemployable. Correct. Yes, yes, sir. Um, you know, we're one of the things that we we're going to do to get people people are leaving is staff burnout. That's usually the number one reason why people are leaving. They're overworked. We're we're understaffed in the times that we're in. Uh, the last two years have been brutal to to staff, to police, to fire, to to everyone in the organization, but just across the country, uh, doing more with less. And uh, that's the one reason why people are, are leaving is burnout. Um, but I think I feel that if we can get our compensation up, attract people. Uh, we'll be able to, to keep them. They can earn a, a good, what they feel is a fair wage. Uh, but also, you know, you always hear people don't leave a job, they leave a, a bad boss. We as an organization do a lot of uh, a good, good work in developing supervisors. We have a, a leadership development program that, we've, that you all have invested in and several staff members have gone through. So that's a continual thing that we're looking at uh, is developing our leaders in the organization. Let me, Mr. Mayor, you'll also let me kind of redirect here. We're trying to resolve the attraction component of employment right now, the ability to retain is a separate question and one in which we are also exploring alternatives. Um, but it's not something we're prepared to bring forward for you today. And uh, the contracts that you've discussed, we've, we've had those before. We've had those discussions before, but there will be things like retention bonuses and those kinds of things that we can look at. But again, trying to keep our eye on the ball today, we're just trying to get to the retention issue with this. We'll worry about the, ret uh, the retaining of those folks after we get to a competitive wage rate. Just a curiosity, because Donnie had mentioned it, and um, it makes, <laughs> Donnie, I hate to bring you back up here, buddy. Um, Obviously, you've been in the force a long time. You've been a policeman for a long time. You're chief here today. And you, you've seen, I guess, a transformation of the department over the years since you've been there. And especially with the younger folks that are coming into the department, you'd made a comment about they're not as concerned about deferred compensation as they are compensation today. Is that correct? I would say that is correct. When I signed on, I signed on for the long haul. I'm seeing with a lot of our younger officers. Um, we are a training ground, which is fine for them if they want to move on to the federal system or the state system, sure. but I would like to get at least five years out of them before they make that move. Sure. So, so the deferred compensation is not as critical as getting the salaries to a point where you can retain and attract. Is that correct? Is that a fair statement, Donnie? I think it is for the folks that are in it for the long haul, because we still have some folks that are in the department that are there for the long haul. Sure. But with some of our younger officers, their deferred compensation is just not there because they don't plan on staying well, there over five years. Well, can I, is there, and I don't know if, if it's doable, if, it, if it's even viable, um, to, to, to have a hybrid system where if you wanted the deferred compensation, you could go that particular route. If you want the money up front, you can go that route. Tony, does that make your job so much more difficult? Because you have to be flexible in today's marketplace. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely have to be flexible in today's market. Uh, we have looked at before here and other places um, uh, cafeteria benefits. Choo pick and choose what sure. you want out of that, that, that way. You know, I think, again, it's also uh, an issue of retention. You know, perhaps um, after five years, we then give uh, a, a contribution to, the, to your 401k, an increased contribution to your 401k, or we give a, 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 a dollar bonus. But again, that's the retention issue, um, not, not necessarily the attraction issue. Um, the other thing I would say is, is that um, the retirement system, the North Carolina government retirement system requires that every employee from day one pay uh, six percent of their salary into the system. So the North Carolina system can't be messed with in terms of, of participation. The rest of the uh, potentially re retaining uh, benefits could be could be looked at. We'll tell you, I, I, I know I hear what Donnie's saying in respect to, you know, the younger officers want to come in, they want their money now. Would that, is, is it a fair statement to say that that's across the board throughout the entire organization? I think the, the majority is that way. I, I think that is very um, 
I think that's a, a very prominent characteristic of a lot of folks that are coming into the workforce today, especially at the entry level positions. They'll leave, as Mr. Raglan would say, for 50 cents more. Sure. Uh, and, and then, of course, they find out they don't have to pay the 6% into the retirement system. And so, you know, there, there are all sorts of um, disincentives and incentives to be in it. And those are part, again, what we would look at for uh, retention. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Just are these frontline, you know, police, fire, the, all the frontline highest level vacancies where I think everybody understands we got to stop the bleeding? <laughs> um, are, are a lot of these vacancies uh, entry level positions for the, and do we have like a, just a from the hip, and it, not, not just for you, Chief, but like is it from, a, a from the hip, like are these a, a high percentage of entry level positions? Yes, I would say most of them are going to be at your entry level because we do have a, they, they do promote within. And so we usually have a, a good list of folks eligible in both departments to promote up. So it's usually the entry level that we have the vacancies at. 75, 80% of the police, public services, community service, fire department vacancies would be a entry level. Is that I would, safe? I would say it's a fair statement. And, and it's not unusual to see that in any department, the finance department, for example, will promote from within generally for the upper level and then the entry level becomes open. So uh, it's not unusual for that to happen. We are seeing some, some increased uh, vacancies at upper level positions, but not to the extent we are at entry level. Okay. Since we got Chief Mason is also here, I'd like to ask him a question in respect to the 13. I know you've got 18 and in, in respect to compensation and, and going back to the same question I asked Donnie and, um, and the manager in respect to deferred compensation or compensating now. And I know you folks talk about this a lot in all your fire stations. Can you give us an update? I, I think offering our folks um, a cafeteria plan um, type package is uh, certainly something that merits some, some study. I think options are very good. Um, I, I think that we have a very good compensation package in terms of benefits. I think our deferred compensation is excellent. Um, however, as Chief Williams pointed out, um, the folks that come into the job today have got to find a place to live and they've got to be able to afford the cost of living to live in this city. And so, so the primary driver of that is what comes in their bank account every week. And so um, while I am certainly appreciative of all the uh, compensation packet pieces of our compensation package, our, our starting salaries and salaries throughout the rank structure is primarily the driver of our turnover. And Steve, when you have your when you have folks that leave the department that are looking for other jobs, let's say in the area, is there a particular department or city or community that they're looking at, or is it is it the same old the same oldies that are that are recruiting your folks that are they are looking at, or is it something totally different? No, sir. The the growth of our surrounding counties uh, and cities are um, offering well as their cities and counties grow, they need uh, public safety personnel, community services personnel, just like we do. Uh, however, they don't have the capacity to train and give the folks the experience that we do because of the size of our city and because of our robust training programs. And so when you look at that, those, sorry, those agencies don't have that overhead. So they can essentially offer someone a, a more competitive wage to come to work for them. And oftentimes that might even result in quicker um, movement through the ranks. So they might leave as a firefighter for us and become a driver or perhaps a lieutenant or even a captain. So there is new pressures on our, our, our keeping our folks here. And uh, like, like Al has said, sometimes it doesn't take but you know $1,000 a year or something to to get someone to move because they can stay in the area, they can work for another agency, don't have to uproot their family, um, and can better weather the cost of living. Okay. Ms. Rambar. So what I hear across the board, and I've heard it for a lot of years, it's money. I mean, that's the, that's the common denominator throughout. Yes, sir. It, it, it is salary. Yes, sir. And it doesn't matter the package. I mean, they, uh, 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 some people that are going to the retirement plan, they can take their retirement plan if it's state 
and take it with them. Yes, sir. It follows they them. They stay in the state of North Carolina, yes, sir, and they work for a firefighter, fire agency, uh, EMS agency, yes, sir. So there's, there's, there's no, if we were paying that pay range for entry level and it, and it, and it continued, what's the matter? If it continued up the grades, yes. we wouldn't be having this conversation as much as we do. I believe that to be true, yes, sir. Okay. So where we are, I mean, we're kind of like the straw that stirs the milkshake in the southeastern North Carolina. Yes, we should sir. be the shining star on the hill. Yes. Where this would be the place they come and want to stay. We are. <laughs> Pardon me? I think we are. I think our fire department is the shining star on the hill. About it. But we're having to constantly rein, not reinvent the wheel, but we're having to constantly start back at zero and, and, and training and losing people and training and losing people just like Chief Williams over at the police department. Yes. So the reality is we had that council meeting about two or three weeks ago where that gentleman from UNCW was showing all the different categories of people that can't live here. Yes, sir. It was a very, very powerful. Uh, um, the school slide. board, the school, the, the teachers have now gotten their supplement up to where there is, they're as good as there is in anywhere in North Carolina. Delert, and it'll start, so. it'll start paying dividends. And at some point we have to bite the bullet and instead of going up piecemeal, we've got to get these people to where they need to be, to where they're proud and want to stay with the Wilmington Fire Department, the Wilmington Police Department. Yes, sir. I agree with that 100 percent. And I think what you just said is a very important piece for uh, everyone to hear. Council has worked for years to work on pay and we have adjusted incrementally. But in my opinion, we've always fallen just a little bit short. We've looked at like 90% of market or, or numbers similar to that, um, which in my opinion has just fallen short. And I, I am very appreciative of the package that what I, what I have seen so far from HR in one, moving our firefighters to uh, $15 an hour. But in, in terms of that, I, it's time that we, if we're, we're having this discussion, it's time we get across the finish line and do it right this time. And I think that that will pay dividends for us down the road in terms of recruitment, retention, uh, and it'll see, send a very clear message that one, we want to attract and rec recruit, attract and retain the most qualified folks here, but we need to keep them. It would sure as heck save us money on training. Absolutely, if, if I may. Uh, Clayton asked me this just before we got started this morning and just in terms of what it costs for us to try, uh, to equip a new firefighter is on around is about ten thousand dollars when you look at certifications um, uh, uniforms equipment uh, that's not the training that is just to get started in this career um, Something else that, uh, that I think we should consider, and I spoke to Tony about this, I don't know that this would, comp would become a labor contract, but I think that when we hire someone uh, and we do make the commitment uh, to train them for six months, almost a thousand hours of training before we allow them the privilege of riding on one of our fire apparatus, that training I don't know what it would cost if they had to go get it in, in at the community college, but it would be on the, the par of several thousand dollars. I think that we can create some sort of sliding scale perhaps from the day that they graduate from the academy to the five-year mark possibly. I don't know. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in that kind of thing, but I would suggest that we create some sort of system that says you will need to stay three years in order for you for us to break even essentially for us to get our investment our return on our investment so perhaps that last five years perhaps we do a sliding scale just to pay for the training that we provided you and that would be my suggestion again I don't know what constitutes a labor contract in in North Carolina and I know that we've had some of these discussions before but I would suggest that we find some way to recoup the training money um, for training our people. And then if they are taken away from someone by another agency or they choose to leave the profession or whatever it may be, then perhaps we can get some return on our investment. Through all of the 
the roller coaster ride and ups and downs that your department has uh, uh, attained an ISO 1 rating, which speaks volumes, volumes about yes, sir. how you handle these downturns and this, yes. these problems. Thank you. I, I thank you, sir, for saying so. And I echo Chief Williams' comments with that. Uh, it's been absolutely incredible to see the challenges that we have had uh, over the last two years, and, and the men and women of the Wilmington Fire Department have stepped up and served this community unwaveringly. Mr. Mayor, I, again, I, I want to emphasize one more time. We need to get the pay to where we can attract the folks. Then we need to work on the retention issue. And we are investigating retention issues, potentials for paybacks, potentials for incentives to stay longer. We will be bringing that forward. But we really wanted to get the pay up to where we thought it ought to be, and that's where the, the, the pay plan adjustment is focused right now. I think you get the pay plan to where it needs to be. I think your retention problems are going to be a whole lot less than what they are now. A absolutely. I could not agree with you more. Well, since we have... Since we have community service and public services in the room also, and we've got 31 and 26, Amy, you want to speak about community services real quick and kind of tell us where those numbers are and who you're having a tough time recruiting or losing? And then I think we've got Dave Mays with public services, and he seems to be the second highest. So go ahead, Amy. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to it. Um, these are primarily entry-level positions, and... I will state that it is very much true in the case of our entry level positions that they want more take home pay. We can't get around the 6% to the retirement system, but that is a real hindrance. These people, they do leave to get more take home pay. Um, this, the openings are primarily grounds technicians and tree trimmers and tree crew leaders. We have proposed in our budget um, a plan that we think could help with the tree trimmers. Currently, you have to be skilled in that area. Obviously, it's a bit of a dangerous job. So the person that we're hiring into that position has to have experience and skills. We're looking at perhaps um, changing that to hire some people at grounds tech positions where you don't have to be as skilled. And we utilize them as a grounds tech while we're training them to become a tree trimmer. So we get someone on board and then we provide um, the training so that they can get the skills to move into the positions. Um, but yeah, take home pay is a big, big one for us. Okay, thank you. Dave? Good morning. Um, I think it's it's fair to say that we're in the similar boat. Most of our positions are uh, at the entry level. Um, as an example, the uh, asphalt repair crew that was approved by city council um, was funded uh, in January of last year. Uh, we have still not filled those positions. Um, we were able to fill one position by an internal promotion. So. Some of the vacancies have created opportunities for our existing staff to, to move up, and that has happened. Uh, but that, of course, creates a vacancy um, below them. So that's just one example. Um, what another thing just to keep in mind that we deal with on a daily basis is the vacancies that are here are not the only issue. We, we deal with the fact that, that, that people are out, whether it's on a medical issue, uh, they're sick, they're on vacation, um, workers' comp. Um, those numbers are in addition to the numbers that you see on the screen. And those numbers challenge us every day to make sure that we can get trash routes done, we can get crews out there to make street repairs. Um, so those are, those are real issues as well. Um, yeah. One other issue that I would bring to your attention is that uh, similar to how the police department, fire department have to train their staff, um, CDL requirements, commercial driver's license requirements, changed in February of this year. There's now a requirement that uh, for a Class B CDL license, which is a typical license for a trash truck driver, um, as an example, or a dump truck driver, they have to go through a, a formalized training uh, element 
to the credit of HR and to the credit of uh, the safety officer within my department, we've put together a program to try and accomplish that. Right now we got the first guy is going through that. Our first employee is going through that program right now to try and get us to where we can um, bring that in-house and control, uh, have some control over that process to get uh, someone that we hire into an entry-level position a path to get their CDL so they can become an operator of, of, one, of our, one of our vehicles. So that's also been something that we've been working on. Okay. But bottom line is, is pay. Yes, sir. I mean, I've had employees talk to me about, uh, you know, whether, you know, they have to make decisions about whether or not they want to uh, invest in the health insurance. I mean, that, because they need the money. They need food on their, on their table. Thank Absolutely. You, Thank you. Thank you. It, if I can, Go ahead, this will please. be for HR, but it looks like the majority of the, I keep calling it stopping the bleeding, is, is our, our front line. Uh, boots on the ground, men and women who, who what they do day in and day out is directly affecting the city's ability to fulfill our core services. Um, so, I mean, looking through the, uh, you know, I've read through this a hundred times, but um, looking through it, I, I want to just continue to focus on what it would look like to target the police, fire, frontline folks. Um, for, for the increases that you guys proposed uh, while understanding budget constraints, um, uh, you know, and, and maybe not doing everything that's asked on some of the other items. Uh, and we can discuss some of that as, as we move along um, or, or getting a little bit more flexible with some of the higher level positions. But uh, I mean, it's, I think it's obvious to everybody up here that these frontline folks that provide the core services and are boots on the ground, I mean, we, we've got to fix this before it, it gets even more out of hand. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the recommendations you're going to see do target those frontline workers and bring them up to the market rate. And in police and fire, we're actually going to be a little bit above market and one of the highest paid agencies in the southeastern part of North Carolina. So um, I'll, I'll get to that here in just a moment. Um, going back real quick, this last bullet point, uh, filling our vacancies has been challenging given the environment we're in. Um, we've seen a, diff a significant decrease in the quantity of applications, at, especially at the entry level um, positions, and those that are qualified uh, for the position. So this, this is exactly why we've been trying to conduct, we've been conducting a compensation study. Um, going back to uh, Councilman Rivenbark's uh, comment, uh, we may be coming back more frequently because the market is changing constantly, daily, um, at a fast pace. So um, uh, we're looking at our overall competitiveness. We want to make sure we retain the staff that we have and then attract new employees so we can continue to meet the needs of the community. Um, as you can see, we started the study back uh, in the latter part of, of 2021, so we've had to age the data uh, to make sure that we're uh, with the recent changes in the market. So our findings, uh, Mr. Ragland presented this uh, the, the January session. Uh, we went out and got all of our benchmark data, and again, our benchmarks are the top 10 municipalities in the state of North Carolina, in addition to our regional benchmarks of New Hanover County, Brunswick County, uh, Leland, Carolina Beach. Uh, we also look at data from the private sector, companies in the state, and the region. Uh, and then based on our analysis, you can see we've fallen behind the market 14% uh, in fire, uh, police grades on average 13%, hourly grades on average 9%, and your salary grades 8%. And I will say, it, it's a lot that we're behind the market. Most of the changes, again, have occurred in the last two years. Uh, we've, that's, it's just accelerated that much quicker. And that's why some of these other benchmark municipalities have already gone ahead and made some mid-year adjustments. So getting to our public safety, um, we're recommending that we add a trainee grade for police and fire. Uh, basically, uh, once they graduate and become a certified uh, officer or firefighter, uh, they will receive a 5% increase in their pay. Uh, and then brought up to that the new minimum of a police officer and firefighter. Uh, we're adding a fire lieutenant grade as a supervisor over our new squad vehicles. And again, these squad vehicles are, are trucks that basically, they're, they're uh, large trucks that have fire extinguishing capabilities um, used to respond to smaller situations in, in areas that are hard to access by a larger truck. Uh, we're adjusting our, our spread from 55% to 60%. Again, this is to match the market. And the spread, just so you understand, is the percentage difference from the minimum of the grade to the maximum of the grade. There's a 60% spread uh, between our minimum and our maximum. What um, is it? I'm sorry, a little loud. 
Yep. What, what is it now? It's the percentage difference no, what, from. No, what is the percentage? You say you're, you're, oh, it's going from 55 to 60. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, employees uh, may receive a market adjustment not to exceed 15% unless they are below the new minimum. And you can see on the screen the, the new minimum for fire is going to be $15 an hour, which when annually it's $43,680 a year. And fire uh, is $21.18 an hour. Um, or for police, it's 2118, and it's $46,257 per year. Do, uh, do we know? Go ahead. Do we know how many are under that new minimum currently? Yes. So uh, I don't have the specific numbers for police and fire, but I do know today in all of our ranges where we're recommending to move them to, um, 370 are below the new minimum before we make any changes. So 370 positions are currently below the. That's for today. everything. That's for not everything. just for this front line. You know the the. Okay. Correct. I was under the impression that everybody in the city was already making $15 an hour. That's what I was told. Well, the, we are making, so we have $15 an hour or $31,200 a year, which every position does make more than that. And that's the, um, the living wage. We use uh, an index used by, um, I forget which university, but the living wage for this area is $31,200. And all of our positions are making more than that. Okay. So, but your recommendation is, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused here, Clayton. $15 an hour is, is a recommendation? Yes, because currently fire is, is, they're not making $15 an hour, but they are making more than that $31,200 threshold because they're, they're on a different um, annual schedule. They Based work, on the hours that they are actually working? Yes, sir. Correct. Okay. So I'd like to know where that university is. They, don't, they haven't been to Wilmington. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one thing I also want to point out here um, is that um, our employees in police and fire can earn $1,000 education incentive for an associate's degree, $2,000 for a bachelor's degree. So our new certified police officer with a bachelor's degree has the ability to earn $48,000 in their first year but when you take into account those educational incentives. Going back to the firefighters, is that that same holds true with them? Uh, yes, sir. Same thing. So holds instead true of 43680 it could be 46. <laughs> yes, sir, exactly. Thank you. And again, we will be leading um, this part of the state um, with these recommendations. I have one more quick follow-up. So when it says employees may receive a market adjustment not to exceed 15%, we're not recommending that everybody that's above the new minimum currently gets a 15% bump for police and fire, right? So is that just going to be on a case-by-case uh, -case basis for those particular departments? Um, so this is just, we're talking just about police and fire. It's I up understand. to 15%. And so, yes, the ranges have moved, and so we're going to move our employees on entry, you know, for police, it's police, and you got corporal and sergeant. We're going to have to adjust employees in the upper ranks as well. Um, but again, it's not going to exceed 15%. So not all getting a flat 15%, they're, they're getting up to a 15%. Up to, it, it varies how much their, their range changed. And the range is, it is changed 5% from the 55 to the 60 the total um, pay range scale, the, right? The, 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 yes, from the minimum to the maximum, that's changed. But our ranges are actually going to shift on average, you know, we're 14% behind market. We're going to shift them on average 14% okay. um, to, not, to, be, to be at the market rate. All right, moving on to our hourly positions. Um, are we recommending increasing the number of pay grades and develop a career progression to help recruit and retain staff. In order to do this, uh, we need to adjust the difference between the pay grades from 10% down to 5%. And this will allow us to create more uh, progressive positions like equipment operators one, two, and three, where your operator one would come in with very limited experience that don't have a CDL, but as they obtain the training and get their CDL, then maybe they can move up to an operator two and receive a 5% um, pay adjustment to the next grade. So if employees can see a, a clear path uh, to move forward, we're more likely to retain those employees. So uh, we're going to work with departments across the board uh, to, to put some of these types of positions into place. Um, all of our hourly positions will be placed in Clayton, grades Clayton, based on the market. Clayton, Clayton, can you hold up a second? Yes, sir. I think Councilman you, Waddell had a, a question. Do they, oh, do they receive these, um, like when, when somebody's coming on, do they get a you know, piece of paper saying, here's your, your tier, this is your you get five 5% five if you hit this and 5% if you hit this and 5% if you hit We don't have that in place today. 
Uh, the only place where we really have that is in, I would say, in public, in, pu in uh, pub uh, police and fire, where they can see the, the different ranks that they can move to. Okay, so this that's what we're going to work on for all the other, for all the other, especially in public services and community services, and entry level jobs. Love it. And, and I think it's important just to note here, the five. If you've got, uh, for example, an E1, and then you've got an E2. Currently, it's ten percent between the E1 and E2. We're going to take it down to five percent between E1 and E2. That's so correct. So we can create more of those opportunities. So you for, create for more opportunities to move up in the grades. Well, correct. That. Okay, good question. When you, when you take it from 10 to 5, does that mean the person that was making that 10% now? I, is I, can't, that? I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. When, when you take it down from 10 to 5, does that mean like John Doe, who's making that 10%, he's going to make less? or No. Okay. No. No, this it's will just, just be the difference between the grades and the ability to move up. Okay, so that means they can move up quicker, yes, but sir. in short steps. Yes, sir. I got you. Thanks. So, yes, sir. I just want to make sure, if I've missed it, my apologies, but we're, we're, we're really kind of focused here this morning or up until now on entry level. And now we're talking about getting them to a, a, a good place. And that certainly has effect on if I've been here five years, somebody comes in. I mean, is this this whole pay scale is moving upward? Yes, this is the whole whole scale. Everybody, All, every every scale will be shifting to the market. Thank you. This is going to impact every employee in the organization. Yes, sir. All throughout the city. All throughout the city. Yes, sir. Clayton, I have one more question, man. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the the employees will receive a market adjustment not to exceed 10 percent unless they are below the new minimum, but it isn't the new minimum the $15 an hour? Yes, yeah, so that it is $15 an hour, um, but we do have other grades that are that are shifting, and we have employees that are going to be below those. So new those grades. will have minimums. Correct. Based on the Correct. percentage scale. And I can give you a, a good example of that would be our uh, RTS operators. The currently making set 15.75 today. Our recommendation is they move to 17.37. So if we move them 10%, and it's not enough to get them up to the to the new minimum, we're going to move them. What, what's an RTS operator? Oh, sorry, I apologize. Recycling sorry. and trash operator. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, moving on to our salary position recommendations. Uh, for our salary positions, it's important to note that uh, many of the employees in these grades are in IT, HR, attorney's office, manager's office, engineering. Uh, they're critical as well to support our frontline and forward facing employees. And over the last several months, we've, we've lost some key folks in these grades as well. Um, so we're recommending that we adjust our salary grades to match the market. Uh, important to point here that we haven't made adjustments to these, these uh, grades since 2015. Um, so we recommend to adjust uh, another, we also recommend to adjust the range spread from 50% to where it's at today to 60%. Um, and that's consistent with the market and to match the market to make sure we're competitive. Uh, employees in salary positions uh, will receive a, a market adjustment of at least 5%, but not to exceed 7.5% unless they are below the new minimum. Our executive positions, um, we're going to adjust our pay range spread from 50 to 70%, and 70% may seem like a lot, but this is consistent with executive uh, grades. Um, you typically see this larger sp spread uh, really to, because the pay for an executive really depends on their experience, qualifications, and it gives the organization a wider range to attract the top talent. Um, we are going to um, combine the department director grades such as HR, IT, public services, community services, engineering, all into one grade, except for the finance director, the fire chief, and police chief, which the market shows us that they're at a higher market rate, so they're going to be in their own grades. The appointed positions are in grades today. We're going to remove those uh, because, as you know, the city manager, city attorney, and city clerk are appointed by council as well as you determine their salaries. Uh, we're recommending that the executive positions receive a flat 5% adjustment. I have a question on the flat 5% adjustment. Yes. Um, so that, that flat 5%, that's an adjustment across the board for all executive positions less the appointed positions? Correct. That's correct. And how many positions is that for that 5% adjustment? Uh, I had to guess at least 13, 10, 10 13. That's how many department directors we have. Okay. And so that's, a, that's a, just a flat 5% adjustment, and, and then we adjust the pay range? Yeah, they're not going to get any, any more. 5% is all they're going to get. five across the board. Yes, sir. 
So the pay range will be going forward. All of them are in the new pay ranges today. They're, the, the range is, they're already in the existing But ranges. that 50 to 70 will be for moving forward, for looking at increases in future years, basically? Correct, correct. That, it gives them more room to grow and gives us a wider opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so go, getting to cost. Uh, police and fire employees will receive adjustments totaling approximately $4.8 million. Uh, public services, community services, traffic, fleet will receive adjustments of approximately $1.16 million and all others approximately $1.1 million. And you can see the total cost is approximately $7.15 million. The cost of the general fund uh, will be about $6.5 million. And then you can see here we broke it down the cost by the other uh, fund types, enterprise listed here. Um, give me one second. So we've listened to your feedback at the January work session and, and have made sure to target our adjustments to those frontline workers and those most impacted by the rising, rising wages. Uh, police and fire will receive adjustments up to 15%, hourly positions 10%, salary positions 7.5%, your executives 5%. Um, and these recommendations will impact every position and every employee in the organization. So everyone will receive some type of adjustment not to exceed the caps of the maximums that I've just mentioned. Um, most importantly, all of our rate pay ranges will be more competitive by moving to the market rate. Um, this will only help us as we go out and try to attract and fill all the vacancies that we have. And, um, and lastly on this slide, we recommend an early implementation of these recommendations um, to help us combat the turnover and retention that existing staff that, uh, and, and, uh, and retain existing staff. And as I said a few slides back, some of these other benchmark municipalities have already started to make um, these adjustments mid-year. Um, however, if, if you give us direction to hold off and make these adjustments at the beginning of FY23 in July, uh, we do recommend some sort of retention bonus that can be provided to the staff that uh, is here to prevent further turnover and also to recognize the contributions of staff who stuck with us during these um, challenging times. Is there a recommendation from HR on what that retention bonus would look like? We, we've, we haven't had much discussion on it, but we can absolutely come back with you with some options on what that retention bonus could look like. And it would be similar to these recommendations targeting that your frontline workers and then, and then scaling it back. So in other words, it would, it would start off up here and as you go down the categories, it would lessen? That's one option we can, we're considering, yes. We have to come back with you on those. Okay. Mr. Mayor, we, we, we had anticipated being further along with budget development than we had, than we are, and anticipated being able to tell you what we might be able to look at in terms of a tax rate increase to be able to fund this. Right now, the best we can tell you is that the maximum would be a two cent tax increase. Um, we're not asking you to buy a pig in a poke, um, and we understand the uncertainty of not being able to, of, of being requested to do early implementation uh, without knowing exactly what that's going to mean in terms of an adjustment on the tax rate. Uh, but we did anticipate we would be at that point. At this point in time, we're not. All we can tell you is that if you uh, authorized us for early implementation, uh, you would be, uh, uh, you could expect to see no more than a two cent tax increase in your recommended budget for FY23. So initially it'd be funded out of the, what? Uh, out of the, the, the next three months would be funded out of fund balance. Okay. Uh, and then uh, with, the new, new, with the new fiscal year, it would take effect uh, out, of the, out of the general operating funds. And be paid back to the fund balance? Uh, no, sir, it would not be paid back to the fund balance. Okay. Do we know how much would come out of the fund balance? I come? do not. We have not done that computation, no, sir. Okay. So little education on the fund balance. I've always thought it was for capital, but you, I guess if you, if you take, one, it, as, one -time if you take it as one chunk, you can do it. One-time expenditures, and this would be considered to be a one-time expenditure because you would be compensating based upon next year's budget from that point forward. So 7.15 is a, what is, what, what's that percent? In the you know like when we in the past we'll give a three maybe a two percent or a three percent or a I mean what's just what's that number represent the average percentage increase employed would mm -hmm. receive um, it, it's going to vary by grade um, 
uh, police and fire, it's going to be more around the 14, 15 okay, well, this percent. This is a percentage of our whole our pay. I'll have to get that number, that exact number to you. Okay. Right. Come back to us later in the meeting. Sure, we can absolutely get you that number later in the meeting. Why don't we do that? And this recommendation would um, get us a lot closer to. We would um, be at market. We'll be at market. Mm -hmm. And leading the market in some areas, like in police and fire. Okay, awesome. All right, thank you. We're we're carrying a hefty fund balance. I mean, we've got like 9.8, I believe, and I'll bring this up later, but 9.8 million that, that I would love to see utilized in a myriad of ways to bring this proposed well, one to, to get our people paid, right? So put it where we can so that we can get our people paid. But also we've, we've had a lot of talk about people that are, you know, our, our folks working for the city that need to, you know, put food on the table and they're making decisions based on that. 0.2 cent tax increase, 2 cent tax increase is affecting the entirety of the city as well. All those folks are also worrying about putting food on the table with seven and a half, eight percent inflation. So um, I think we need to look at how to disperse that $10 million uh, back to the citizens of Wilmington however we can. Okay. Um, and just a couple more slides here just to, to summary, you know, why we're doing this. Uh, one problem staff believe, or this, this is a large investment. We understand that. Uh, it's a lot less expensive in the long run when, you, when we discussed we were having earlier about uh, being a training ground for, for folks and then the, us leaving. Um, so this is only going to help us attract and retain our talented workforce, be more competitive. It's going to help reduce our turnover, um, increase productivity, employee morale, because we're going to be able to hire and keep people, get more work done. Uh, and, and really recognize that our employees are our greatest asset. And hearing your comments today, I know every one of you agree with that. And so last slide, our next steps, want to receive your feedback and direction. Uh, we're finalizing our position grades and placements, uh, include salary adjustments into the FY23 budget process, and then uh, lastly, communicate uh, to our staff um, the changes. Clayton, j just, I, I know that we're dealing with today's salaries and, um, and how far down we are. But you had made a comment earlier about just um, employ, employment in the coming, moving forward in the future. There are less bodies, there are less people that are coming into the workforce. And we're hearing it not only in government, we're hearing it in the private sector too, in the industry that we're in. We're hearing it from a lot of the construction trade. They just can't find the workers in the private sector, and I'm hearing it in the restaurant business, I'm hearing it in just, in just about every segment. So it's just a percentage of the population that is aging, that is retiring, and the folks that are stepping up to fill those jobs, we just don't have them at the numbers that we've had them. And then looking at some of the statistics from the last pandemic that happened over 100 years ago, same thing seemed to have happened that the labor costs dramatically increased after that pandemic resided. Labor costs dramatically increased for a couple of years afterwards. So we're kind of tracking in that same direction, it seems that way, that less people going into the workforce, labor costs continue to increase across all segments of the economy, including government. Is that a first you, thing? You painted a perfect picture. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Okay. So we're in a competitive environment, and we're losing some folks to, to the private sector, and we're losing some to just a different lifestyle. Some people decided to work from home. Correct. And it's just changed the whole field. It has, and we're all reacting to it. Okay. I mean, Bill, to, to pile on that a little bit, I mean, the pendulum, pendulum swing back. Sure. You know, it's just like I remember coming out of the, you know, 2010, 20, nobody wants to, I don't want everyone to own a home again. You know, I'm just going to rent. The Great Recession. And now all you hear <laughs> is I'm, you know, there's those folks that say with that they're, they, they're trying to buy a home. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of like right now everybody wants to go out and, and I don't blame them. I feel the same way. I'd love to go, you know, open a bar in the Bahamas or something. But, <laughs> but you know, there's, that swings back over time. You sure. know, people start to, so it's just a, it's where we are right now, I guess, in, in coming back from the pandemic. That's correct. Well, 
And, and I do know that we have, you know, our rank and file is, I mean, the, the folks that are, that, that are in those positions in, in public safety and uh, public services and, and, and uh, community services are important. Uh, the other part of this is your, your upper echelon staff, too. The talent that you have there, you have some significant talent in this organization, and you don't want to lose those folks either. You got and, it. And, and I know that they're very talented because I know they're being recruited. And rightfully so. I mean, they're doing a tremendous job for our community. So you've got some great talent there, too. So it, it comes across the board. I know that we're here to really help that rank and file, but we also may, we don't want to lose that significant talent that we have at the upper tiers also because they've been here for quite some time. They've, they've been part of the success of this community in this city, and they're a very important part of the organization also. I mean, I, you know, Tony, I hate to say it, you're like a general manager of a football team. I mean, you got some superstars. You, I, I understand it. it. It's a tough position to be in. Uh, the, the, all I say is name the we coach. We represent the owners, which are the citizens, so we're trying to balance it all year. I'd say name the coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and probably not 12 people can do it, but they've got the best talent of anybody yeah, in the league. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you're going to get back to us on that yeah. number before we make a decision, Tony? Yes, sir. It, it, Just to what, be clear, the average, the average percentage yeah, increase. I think, Luke, um, is that what you, you were asking? Yeah. That way we can make the decision based on the last next three months whether to make the adjustment and move yes, forward sir. and take it out of the fund balance. Yes, sir. Okay. Right. Good Great. presentation, sir. Good. Can we yeah. take like a three-minute break, yes, break for one second? Thank you.
He should have just said, get to lunch. I'm not about to do that. <laughs>
Okay, we're back from break. Okay, Mr. City Manager, what's next? I got it. Oh, oh do I need to roll call again, uh, Miss uh, Penny? Do I need to roll call again or we're okay? Okay, well, let's do the roll call again. All right. Mayor Pro Tem, are you here? Present. Councilman Reinbark, are you here? Yes, sir. Councilman Anderson has left um, at this moment. He's going on a family vacation. Councilmember Barnett? Here. Councilmember Spears, are you here? Councilmember Spears? Here. Yes. Councilmember Waddell, are you here? Here. Okay, and the chair's here. We have a quorum and we can proceed. Good. Good morning or good afternoon. It's very close to either. I'm going to walk you through the FY23 financial position today, and I'd like to first start out with just some estimates that we have for FY22 fiscal year. We're showing you, we don't normally show you a very big graph, but this one we're showing you a kind of a high level look at where we believe we're going to be ending. The revenues we believe will end at about $124 million. We'll be spending about 117 million in expenditures, and that will bring um, seven, about seven million into fund balance. I have to let you know that the documents you have in front of you had a little gremlin, computer gremlin, and I believe yours says 7.8. It's actually closer to seven million. So I will correct that in a follow-up for you. So let's look a little deeper into some of the revenues. Revenues statewide are seeing higher than budgeted um, growth, and Wilmington is also reflected in that. Sales tax is higher than any of the estimates that we had predicted. Um, comparing the seven months year over year, to give you an example, if you look at FY20 to 21, the first seven months, the state increased by about 9.14%, and the city, for the first time, was a little bit less then the state at 6.9. Jump to current, FY21 to 22, the state has seen a 15% growth in the year over year in the first seven months, and the city is now 16% year over year. Projections for FY22 are, however, going to end 12% um, higher than last year, and that is taking into account the inflation. If you recall, sales tax is three and a half months delayed before we see what consumer behavior is going to be doing. The next one that we have is April 15th, and that is going to tell us January's sales. Um, and then it's also taking into account uh, the Russian invasion and the sanctions and the impacts that are going to eventually stream down and whatever happens in that situation is clearly unknown at this point in time. Quick, Intergovernmental, quick which... Question. Sorry to interrupt. Um, so we have about a $5 million discrepancy between the uh, FY22 year-end estimate of $124 million and the FY2022 revised. It was those, that, that difference, so that, I mean... Basically, we're going to end up, we're projecting to end up almost exactly where we, our actual numbers from 21. I think what you're um, referring to is you do not see the use of the fund balance that we budgeted. So when we have, yeah, Got when it. we have more revenue and less projections, we do not use the fund balance. Correct. That's, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, number two is intergovernmental revenues. Um, it's projected slightly higher than what is budgeted. This is a little bit difficult to estimate since we only get most of the ones in this category quarterly. So we only have one data point to project towards the end of the year. Um, uh, ABC revenues, however, following the state trend, we are seeing higher than normal budgets. The Powell bill, if you recall, last year, North Carolina Department of Corrections was having um, a somewhat budget crisis, and they had decided that they might change the appropriation for the Powell bill from 100 or 147 down to 132. That was a deduction for cities of 3.8%, and that's what we budgeted. That didn't come to fruition, and we are seeing that come back at normal rates. Miscellaneous. Uh, revenues is really just that. We have the rental, um, rental vehicle tax in there, and so as the restrictions were opening, rental vehicle tax started to increase. 
and we are getting probably about 153 more than what was budgeted, and that's just because of the pandemic. We're seeing the Live Nation sponsorship come in, which was also not budgeted. We sold Optimus Parked, which was not budgeted um, for $300,000. And then the last, which is good news, is the fire construction will be up about 50,000 over budget, which is due to the construction that you're seeing, the permits. But we do expect that to slow as the federal government does um, implement some um, rate increases throughout the next year. For the expenditures this year, um, I, I won't belittle the point about the tight labor market, but when you have the tight labor market, you do see salary and benefit um, salary savings. On the flip side to some of the departments, you do have to pay overtime depending on what their um, purpose is, but we are seeing that the overtime is not going beyond the salary savings at this moment. Um, not only is there salary and, and benefit savings, you also have operating that would be spent on those, those services or those employees, and we are not needing to do the trainings and things like that, so some of that is going to be going unspent. Can, can I ask you, uh, it, mm -hmm. where, the ABC um, money that we received from ABC the ABC revenue? Yeah, wh where, which one is that in? Inter That's an intergovernmental. Inter and how much was that over... It's probably, it's, I think it's going to be about 800000 is what I'm expecting. I budgeted an, uh, an additional 700000 for FY23, and that brings it to what I estimated for FY22's ending. Um, because it seems to kind of go up and down, and it's not consistent to get a trend, but I'm incrementally increasing it based on the new trends. Okay. Um, lastly, the pieces of equipment. Uh, we, are, we are ordering pieces of equipment, but we have supply chain issues. We have cancellations. We had a, um, all, a fleet of our police orders that were canceled. Uh, we have companies that are no longer having stock, and they said that you can order the pieces of equipment, but you may, I think this is a police department, you can get the cars, but you won't have the chips to run the cars, so there's no point in actually doing that. So in next year's budget in FY23, that money in fleet will fall to fund balance, and we're going to reappropriate it for those items that we were not able to buy, hoping that the supply chain changes and we will be able to catch up with FY22 and FY23. What you just are talking about, is that on one of these charts? No, I was just ta talking about the, le the remaining money and why, so that's in the department section and why we're going to have roughly $10 million there that you can see that will be unspent based on the budget. This may be a question for the city manager, but we, we um, bumped a big vehicle purchase for the police department that was supposed to be done at the end of FY22 or beginning of FY23. Do we get those cars or, geez. Laura, you can go ahead and answer that question. I, I, I... The, the big order for the police, that was the that one was that the was one. canceled. We tried. Uh, so many times we come to council with a mid-year adjustment. Um, for those that aren't aware with the ordinance that we passed for the general fund, we have an extra layer of accountability. We budget by function, and sometimes we project out that those functions are going to go into the negative. We do not have that this year because of the vacancies and everything that I had shown you. But we are going to bring forward some items, and one is the purchase of the Harrelson building and the operating for the rest of the remaining of the year. And then there's a potential CIP project, pro, project discussion that is going to come forward um, regarding Encino and MLK, and that will be coming in the next couple months in fiscal year 22. I'm, I'm having trouble here. It's going to be, it's going to cover what? The last two things you said? A discussion will be forthcoming regarding the Encino um, soccer complex as well as the MLK project. Okay, when you said, I'm sorry, when you said Encino, I thought, what the hell are we doing with Encino? <laughs> 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 Military cutoff. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, Laura, just quickly, the, the MLK kitchen, um, I, th I thought we were doing ARPA funds or something and, and we were, I mean, it keeps coming back. I thought we've already made this commitment. And, and had figured out a way to fund it. 
I think there's going to be a discussion with council on the engineering um, aspects coming and then we are still waiting to see the cost and who is going to help us work through it. It has not been decided at this point, but we're coming forth. What do you mean who's going to help us work through it? What does that refer there, to? There, there are, as you know, um, some design questions with regard to the MLK, um, and we're going to try to resolve those and bring those back to you um, at some point in the near future. Are you talking about the whole building? Yes, or, sir. Or, okay. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I, my concern has been for several years getting the MLK kitchen up and running to serve the community in a variety of ways. And I thought we had already made that commitment and that we had funding for it. It, it, I, it will be included, but it's part of the bigger picture as well. They're linked together. You don't want to do one without the other. Thank you. So just a quick follow-up, Tony. Um, so we are working on the, the misunderstanding of the design of MLK. The we're, 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 we're trying to re, uh, resolve design issues with regard to that facility right now. We'll be bringing you back a revised proposal in the future. Yeah. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, the projected fund balance, I know this is a topic of interest. Um, if you recall, our fund balance policy for the general fund is to keep a 20 to 25 percent fund balance. In practice, we suggest council should keep about a 30 percent given the location we are, given the hurricanes, uh, and given the delay in our revenue that we have to pay our bills in the first three and a half months. Um, this is a moving target, as you can see from this slide. In the beginning for FY22, the estimated fund balance was at 37%. Adjust, um, adjusted budget, it went down to 35 and a half, and projected it went to 37%. Council adopted a policy that anything over the 30% could be used um, once if council approved for one-time items as well as moving it to debt to pay down the um, the next CIP's tax increase. So if we increase capacity in the debt model, we wouldn't have to increase taxes as much. And so the, the projected year end is 9.8 million. Do we have a, are we beginning to have a, uh, uh, a map of how we're gonna use that 9.8 million? Jennifer has a map. Jennifer does have a map, okay. Yes, good afternoon. Um, currently we are working through the budget request for fiscal year 23 and while looking at the budget request, we'll be determining what one-time funding we wanna recommend coming forward that will be used with the fund balance. In addition, we have um, CIP requests for fiscal year 23. Um, that you'll see soon that have about $16 million from the general fund and whatever we do not use of this fund balance toward one-time purchases for the fiscal 23 budget will go toward those additional requests um, being asked for CIP for increases in costs and other projects that have come up that will uh, be presented to council. So there is a plan to, to <coughs> use this um, and, and keep our 30% level of fund balance. Again, just know that we are in March, so as we work through to June 30, this amount may decrease or increase, but we'll take that into consideration with our funding. Do we have a inclination on whether it would decrease or increase? Um, as Laura mentioned, with our sales tax revenue being three and a half months behind, mm -hmm. um, we really won't know what our sales tax revenue is for the year until we get to October. Um, and that's when we close out the year. So um, there may be some funding that we have additional that when we close out the year that we can come back to council and say, you know, we, we'd like to appropriate this over to the, the capital program. Thank you. Just, did I understand you say we were gonna keep it at, I see the 30% is our benchmark yes, for, for the undesignated fund balance? Uh, yes, sir. Our policy is a minimum of 20 to 25 percent of the operating budget, but we have, um, at, at least in the last six years that I've been here, recommended that we keep that at 30 percent level. And I think we all seen why when we had Hurricane Florence hit in fiscal year 19, why that's important. And that was the reason for my 
question and bear in mind that cost, whatever we spent for Florence, you could add probably 20, 25% of that if we had a similar event coming up in the fall or whenever. Yes, Thank sir. you. The cost was 33.2 million. Well, you do the math. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, and now I'd like to go into the FY23 budget um, position. We have already walked through the strategies, so I'm not going to walk through them again. But as we develop this budget, as we go through this work session, feel free to let us know and we will add something if we are missing it. So some of the economic drivers that we are being challenged by, um, everyone is being challenged by these. Uh, we have discussed we have discussed the pandemic, but during the pandemic, the federal government has um, provided stimulus to keep people, businesses afloat during the pandemic, and we didn't know how long it was going to be. So at this point in time, so far, $4.6 trillion of assistance have been given. $52 million has gone to North Carolina. The city has had direct of $31 million. This is one time. Hopefully it will stimulate some things in the economy going forward, but the sales tax that you do see is some of this coming back into our community, and it is going to slow. Um, we are dealing with inflation. Uh, it is 7.9%, as Clayton had discussed. For uh, example, 13 months ago in January, it was at one4 and we're at 7.9%. It's pretty significant jump um, in one year. So we want to keep that going. Um, perfect storm, really, with the pandemic, the, the assistance that we got from the federal government. People were staying at home. There is a pent-up demand. There's money. And now there's less supplies out there. And so that's driving up inflation. So in an effort to slow the economy, the government has, Federal Reserve has increased its first um, interest rate to 25 or half of, half a percent to 50 percent and they are saying that there's going to be several more on the way. The labor market, I won't continue to belittle that. We, we have um, discussed it. Upskilling, people are just changing. There's, they're doing different skills to stay at home with their family. Um, they're having um, reprioritizing their lives, autonomy challenges. We're seeing all those people now with the pandemic coming to uh, be more controlled or starting to retire. Uh, we have technology, which was also mentioned, that is also offering a new challenge to people who want to hire. The concept of distance and proximity in home is not necessarily a barrier anymore when you do, when you do telework. Um, and so people are sometimes changing to that option. And then, of course, we have the international unrest, the sanctions. Um, gas prices were already increasing prior to this, but we saw a significant increase after this. Um, we have further supply chains, and frankly, we just don't know what's going to happen as this moves forward. So how does it impact us locally? Um, as Clayton had said, our human capital, we're stretched thin. Um, we have people who are working a significant amount of time um, to make up for the vacancies. We're trying to get the same services out the door to the community without them feeling that hiccup. We have supply chains that are, are dwindling. We have orders that are being canceled. And we have ongoing costs that are starting to increase. Not only are our, our um, supplies increasing, but any contract we have, they're feeling that those services are feeling the same pressures we are, and they're increasing the costs for that service to us. We have revenue disruptions, which I will show you in the next slide and walk you through that. Um, making it a little bit difficult to predict the future, future budgets. Um, some good news with the employee benefits, um, health insurance, and the local government employee retirement system are going to rem um, remain, or health insurance and LEO, sorry, there's a bubble in the middle, and LEO are going to remain flat in the budget. Um, we do have a percent increase for the local, the re employer's retirement portion that we pay. For five years, they uh, have been increasing it by, I think, 1.2%. And on the fifth year, they were going to drop that down to 1.1%. So 
We haven't got the letter, but we should have a little bit of savings in that known increase there. And now for the disruptions. I've told you this periodically through since FY19, despite the state and other jurisdictions seeing record highs in their revenues that are exceeding their budgets, a few jurisdictions like us have to deal with hurricanes. So in FY19, we had an impact with Florence. The city saw year over year sales tax recovery efforts for 11 months. That was a significant amount of time. Usually it takes two months for our sales tax to go back to normal after a hurricane. We saw 11 months. One of the assumptions that I am now finding in the data, which is somewhat dwindling recently, but um, if the, the month that is collected is 20% over the prior year's month, typically there's a hurricane and we're recovering from that. We had seven of those months immediately after Hurricane Florence. We only had an average of two every year prior to that. So that gets into one of the disruptors because that is now stretching over two fiscal years, FY19 and FY20. We had the marketplace realtor sales tax come into play where we were accepting sales tax from those people who are bought purchasing items online. That came into effect in the beginning of, or in FY20, and the state doesn't have any data that we can tell how much is being impacted. So there's one month where Hurricane Dorian came and Jennifer and I were trying to figure out if it was the market realtor or if it was Hurricane Dorian that was impacting sales tax because that was another one that was 20% over the prior year's month. Then along came the pandemic, where the last quarter of FY20, we lost 10% of our sales tax in that quarter. And we were pretty lucky because a lot of the jurisdictions around the state actually lost 20 to 25%, and it was expected that we'd all lose about 30. And the only data point that we had was how China um, got through their beginning portions of the pandemic, and so everyone was estimating about 30% loss, but we didn't know how long that was going to be. It did last for about a quarter. The two, the two months in FY20 allowed us to hit our budget, so the two months that were 20% over the prior year allowed us to hit our budget, and we, we weren't at a loss. When we developed the 21 budget, there were several jurisdictions that did cuts. We did restrictions and put money into restrictions, so we were saving that. Long came the first and second quarter. We were having year-over-year -year sales tax of 20% or more. We had our first $3 million in December, the highest we've ever had, and it's just been steady ever since. <laughs> So it's just there's all these disruptors that anything that we used to do, the historical averages from year to year to year are no longer there. And now we're looking at year over, month, year, over year month differences and month to month differences. And so we're, we have to change what we do um, based on current trends. And that is how we're going to be budgeting the budget. And then, of course, we have Russia, which I've already talked about. Russia, the impacts that we have yet to see. So, so, so Laura, let me just ask you, in regards yeah. to your modeling, your modeling this year's budget that we're working on, on the possibility of five rate increases, are you taking that in, I mean, you, I mean, obviously you've alluded to the fact that they just did one, which is a half, but are you, are you, I'm basing, sorry, I can't are you basing, you. The, are you basing your economic model on the rise in rates that the Fed has alluded to or has no. shared with us? No, I'm, right, I'm basing our rates on collections that we are seeing coming okay. in. But and we have not been doing that. But you're contemplating that the rate increases by the Fed will have some negative impact yes. on the sales tax revenue? Yes, that is polarizing some of the concepts. Sure. So we're trying to find that balance. Do you have an idea as to a percentage or an idea? I do not. Number? Okay. All right. Thank you. 
So some of the budget assumptions um, that we are going forward with as we review the um, budget and try and make it balance is the revenue adjustment. Um, the city manager had just suggested that it might be a maximum of two cents um, and staff is doing that for obvious reasons, the compensation study, which you've heard about. We have inflation that is continuing to go on. We have the infrastructure, the new river lights that we have to fund staff, most likely for a half a year, not a full year. Um, and all these things are going to be eating into some of the revenue that we have going um, and need to be able to fund that. But again, we are reviewing all of that and we will bring forth a recommended budget in May. Uh, we ha have dedicated an, an additional 10% to the competitive processes, each of them, and then we are budgeting modestly um, the revenues that we are looking at based on current trends. Hey, Laura, another mm -hmm. question, and I guess this question is more for Tony. Tony, on some of the um, things that Laura has brought up today in respect to the kitchen, the Encino, the possibility of the new the fire station needs transportation, are we, are we going to be looking at doing one-time expenditures coming out of the uh, fund balance to, to, to kind of bridge some of these? De depends on the, the, the breadth of the gap. Um, there will be some money that will be available in the, in the um, uh, debt model uh, with regard to the way in which we have not or, or have spent our money from there. <laughs> there will be some money that will be needed from fund balance, um, and there will be money that will be shifted from other projects. Do we, know, do we know as of today what kind of a fund balance you're going to be asked or you're projecting for this coming year? I know in the past we've been up to 30 uh, percent. Can, can you tell us that? Is it open? The, um, the, the amount that you see in the 9.8 million, that mm -hmm. is what we're projecting that we will have um, to keep our 30 percent. So if we spend that 9.8 million in the fiscal year 23 budget mm -hmm. or even from now until June, some of that, we will be at a 30 percent going into fiscal year 23. Um, so some of the, you know, I mentioned the, the CIP projects that we have um, about 16 million, and then as you mentioned, the MLK project as well as the soccer complex. We in, analyze these CIP projects and determine of those what can we include in our next bond issuance for our installment purchase bonds, and we determine what maintenance projects we have coming with the increasing costs and take those analysis and what can we fund from fund balance in the general fund and then what can we take from the debt capacity that we have built up because of the low interest rates that we've received over the last couple of years to fund the rest of that so that we can continue with those projects that council has already approved and make sure that we don't have any stoppage on those waiting for funding. So that's how we um, are looking at using that. But it will be with that 9.8 million, that will keep us at 30% going into the next fiscal year. Okay. So, so okay. Gotcha. I, I have a little yeah, go ahead, Luke. question about the, I'm just going to hit the fund balance again. 30% <laughs> fund balance is, is great, and I understand the need, especially, you know, with, uh, with hurricanes that come up. But when we're looking at record-setting inflation, you know, 7 percent 8%, $30 million fund balance over a year goes down to $27.9 million. Uh, I think that should be taken into consideration that we're losing value on this money um, by just holding it in reserve. Um, so I'm, I'm a saver. Uh, I'm not an economist, but I am a businessman, and I realize it's about the worst time in my lifetime to hold uh, a, a balance like this um, on your balance sheet. So I, I would advocate that we look at not getting crazy with it, but uh, giving a, a break to our citizens by utilizing some of these, some of this fund balance, um, maybe past that 30%. I and mean, then I hear people say, well, we'll lose our AAA bond rating. I'd love to see the numbers as related to AAA to a, to a AA, a AA with a uh, small AAA, some of, some of those items, because that seems to be what I'm hit with any time I even mentioned getting below a 30 percent uh, number. Well, I think, General, you, you, you have an answer to that question. Um, yes, sir. Uh, Laura had mentioned that you had a question about that. Um, I reached out to get some rate comparisons and, 
you know, there's more to um, just being rated as a AAA compared to a AA going into the market. There's also the fact that we are a AAA, and if we do something that gets us downgraded, that's going to impact more than just the rates, but the investors on considering to buying our bonds. There's going to be question about why did they go down. Um, you know, it's not something that's easily taken. With the rates, the comparison, um, we do 20-year debt normally. So that's about a 20 to 30 basis point difference between going into the market as a AAA versus a AA. So if we take what our outstanding debt is today, about $285 million, if we were to borrow that at a AA rating versus the AAA, that would cost the city $10 million more just in the additional interest. And would a, would a reduction of the, of the fund balance from, and this is just maybe just a bit of a learning experience for me up here, so I'm not advocating for anything at the moment, but um, would, a, would a reduction of the fund balance from a 30% to say 25%, would that, would that initiate a, a reduction in our AAA rating? No, sir, it would not. What the bond rating agencies do is they look at our five-year trend of our fund balance level. If we have a significant drop like we did with Hurricane Florence in fiscal year 19, they want to know why and what action is being taken to get back to that, where is this going to be a common trend for the city of Wilmington that we're going to continue to spend our um, fund balance, and as long as we're not doing it on operations and we have a plan on what we're doing it and makes sense, they take that into consideration. Um, so it is, they look at many factors um, on that, and, and that's why our policy is at 20 to 25 percent minimum, but again, um, experiencing Hurricane Florence like we did, usually Hurricane Florence, Dorian, and Isaias came every single year, and they all came around September. So we don't know, you know, what impact we're going to have, what storms we're going to have, how great they're going to be. Um, so that's why I caution and recommend that 30 percent level. Um, we have it there if something comes up during the year and we have um, some cost increases or an emergency that comes up. And we can always go back to our fund balance and use that to help us and respond to the citizens' needs as we go through the year having that fund balance there. Thank you for that. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Just one more follow-up. Is, is, am I incorrect in my just kind of back of the napkin math on 7 8% inflation? Is that, I mean, that, that money that's sitting there, is it's, it's losing value, correct? We have, um, we, we, we go out on the curve and we do investments. So um, with the Fed increasing their rates, we are seeing higher interest rates that we're receiving in our revenue. And I think Laura um, has some information on the year over year um, interest investment revenue. So we have it invested in different agencies, different markets to help us get revenue off of that money that we're saving. And again, it's a projection on as we receive revenues in compared to as those outflows are going. So to ha say that we have that money sitting in the bank today, this is a projection based on our budget projections as to how much we'll have if everything stays static the way it is budgeted. Thank you. Well, if we were allowed to go out and, and invest our money in some medium risk or high risk <laughs> ventures, that would be another story, but we're, we're pretty hamstrung about yes, what we can statutes do. statutes dictates what we can <laughs> invest our funds exactly. in, and of course they are the safest instruments that we are allowed sure. to invest in. And I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I'm getting ready to. When Hurricane Bertha hit here in 1996, the city of Wilmington had just completed two days prior the final sweep cleaning up Hurricane Bertha, two days Hurricane Fran hit, and it was even three times more devastating. So we had two, I don't know if they would be considered two or one or three, but they were bad. First Baptist Church steeple was laying across the Keenan Fountain. And I'm telling you, those people, we have them under contract, these cleanup crews, but they will go wherever the money is. And if you, ha if you can't pay those folks on the day of, they'll go somewhere else to clean up debris. And, and I, I know it's, I sound like Chicken Little, the sky's falling, but I'm telling you, <clears throat> when, when hurricanes hit, and we could have three, we could have none. We went 22 years until Bertha hit without a hurricane. I'm just telling you, you better have money in your savings account to, to, to pay up. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I grew up in East North Carolina, and I've seen hurricanes my whole life, so I certainly understand, and I don't think I'm uh, 
advocating here for anything outrageous, but when we're talking about doing a 2% tax increase uh, on our citizens in time of the highest inflation in my lifetime and many other folks' lifetimes with no end in sight, uh, I think it's prudent to look at all options to maybe reduce this 30% number that we have to something not crazy, you know, 25% to lighten that load from 2% to 1%, whatever we can do to the people who are putting food on their table every day. That's really my main point here and all that. Um, and to Luke's point, and, and, and we don't want to put it all on the back of the taxpayer, and if you have an additional funding that you can use from that fund balance for one-time expenditures like finishing the soccer complex or finishing the MLK kitchen or whatever, the case is we like to go to the fund balance without putting it in such a deficit that it affects our bond rating and or, to Charlie's point, and I, I guess it really hit home with uh, Hurricane Florence, the devastation that we saw, and I believe that we still do not have 100 percent of our revenue back from the state or the federal government, which we've been waiting for now, what is almost four years, going on four years. Is that correct, Jennifer? That is correct. We are still waiting for about $8 million um, from Hurricane Florence. Four million of that will be coming back into the general fund. We also have convention center repairs and stormwater drainage repairs yeah. that we are still waiting for. Um, but we are, again, still working on projects to get them completed, yeah. to get the documentation to, to FEMA. So Florence was huge, um, a huge impact to us, and it's taken a long time to recover from, yeah. from that and then having the additional two storms on top of that. And to Charlie's point, having that money in that account allowed us to clean up, get back on our feet faster than a lot of other communities around us. I do know that, unfortunately, in Pender County, the devastation was dramatic and, and significant also, and they had to go into, onto the open market to borrow money to further their cleanup efforts, which really put them in a very uh, tough position as a community and as a county government. So to have that money in place, ready to go, cleaning it up as quickly as we can and getting businesses and people back uh, online and, and getting them getting their lives back after a significant storm like that is imperative but I'm also with Luke if we can use that fund balance for one-time expenditures to help us you know accelerate some of these projects that we've been talking about for years without affecting the fund balance to such a degree that it affects our rates and affects our bond rating and um, affects us in the event of a natural disaster like hurricanes I'm for, and I think that city manager and the city team here has done a good job in balancing that over the years. I've seen a fund balance here, believe it or not, as low as 12% when we had a big snafu with the county in regards to an, uh, um, our, our, our pre property tax. Our property tax yes, rate. Sir. When they called me into a meeting one time and says, "Oops, we made a mistake. It's about 10 million dollars we had to come out of that fund balance with at that time." Uh, which put us at a pretty significant disadvantage. Thank God we didn't have a storm that year, but that's what these things are for at times. A couple of things, uh, Councilman Waddell, in case you don't know, during Florence, we also used funds from the Debt Service Fund to be able to bridge the gap on, on cash flow. So it wasn't just using the, um, uh, the fund balance. So we, 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 we robbed Peter to pay Paul there for a while. Uh, second thing is, and, and, and I, I like uh, Councilman Rivenbark, I've been through, Fran. Uh, Florence was bad. You put, you put some wind behind Florence, and we really got a problem. Um, so I, I would say that, that that's a caution. And then finally, Councilman Waddell, uh, <clears throat> we can use uh, portions of the uh, fund balance to buy down uh, future tax increases. The way the debt model works is there's a, a, a proposed tax increase for the next CIP process, and if we get cash into it ahead of time, then we can buy down that cost. I realize that still doesn't address your concern about the two cents now, so two cents now or a penny and a half later, I, I understand where you're going, but just so you know, you have that, that knowledge with regard to the, to the balancing act. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And, um, Certainly not advocating for a 12% uh, <laughs> 12 fund balance. Uh, just just throwing some options out there. <laughs> I don't want to see that in Port City Daily tomorrow, you know. But. So now let's look at some of the revenues as we go forward. Um, property tax, we got you our. Did you say it? Go ahead. Go ahead, 
Thank you, Councilman. Kevin? No, I was just telling Luke he did say it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. So the graph you see in front of you is um, the percent change for property tax estimates, history, and um, estimates. Your, your growth has been pretty positive until this year where we will be remaining flat. Um, there are two reasons that I'd like to walk you through why we're remaining flat this year. Um, North Carolina Constitution has brownfields properties in it. It has a state um, statute it is an agreement between the Department of Environmental Quality and the owner. The definition of Brownsfield is essentially the, an idle, unusable property where the threat of contamination um, and is there and it requires remediation. There you have qualifying improvements, which is what makes up that agreement with the environmental um, Department of Environmental Quality. So when those qualifying improvements are remediated and the property is completed, they are allowed an exemption. So what does that mean for the city? Um, if you categorize all of the Brownsfields properties owners after that completion gets a credit, you can see from um, the amount, it's a staggered property tax exemption. The first year they get authorized, 90% is an exempt, and so they're only paying 10%. Year two, 75%, so they're only paying taxes on 25%, and so on. Lord, yeah. another question real quick. I do know that you have uh, appeals to the tax department when you get your uh, value assessed. Do we keep up with those appeals to understand how many of the appeals that are within the incorporated city limits have been reduced? Because obviously it affects revenue that comes into the city. Do you that is correct. That would be the second part of this flat. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you're fine. And we can get that number too. Um, the county assess, or the county tax administrator has been very helpful in getting this data to us. So um, as noted, the first year is exempt, um, but prior to that, and the most important thing to understand is that those property owners were paying tax on the completed portion of that land. And so they could be paying 50% the year prior to the tax exemption, it could be 75%. They complete it, they get the Browns tax, or the Brownsfields property tax, and they go to 10%. So we're getting some money throughout their development, but we're not getting all of it, and then they apply for this. So when we got the data uh, and we were flat, we asked the tax administrator to send us some data, and 96 properties were in bronze field status. Majority of them were in year two. You can see 93 of those were in year two. Um, the total assessed property value for all of those is $209 million. The tax exempt is 164, and the property tax value is 45 and a half, which is 21% of the total value. Three of those, well, let's, oh, I'm jumping ahead. Um, so to show you how much the impact to the city, I put it into our little formula. Um, Bronzefield is 2094. Um, you can see it walk through. The one cent that it would um, bring is about $21,000. If you look at the red box, that's the amount that we could have in the first column. We, we would be able to budget in the general fund and the debt service. It's almost $800,000. Because of their status and because of where they are in the tax exemption, of that $800,000, we can only budget $171,000. Three of those properties, the flats, Pier 33, they're on their first year the coming this coming year, and River Place, which is on their second year, make up $492,000 of that. So you can see that the other ones are a little smaller, but we got hit by three big properties, and they will be walking through their five years of tax exemptions. The second one are the appeals. Um, we had a reevaluation year and they typically get a lot of appeals during that. They sent out the notices in February of 2021. May, they, it was the deadline, May 11th. The appeals were over 5,000 and the majority of them we were told were in the city limits. 
Wilmington had 46% of those appeals, so sorry, not, not the majority. Um, the board was active all the way through December, which is they were working twice a week going through appeals through December. Uh, we, we didn't know the impacts until they always send us estimates as we go through the budget development, so we just got the, the second estimate yesterday. These appeals total about $188 million in assessed values. Between the appeals and the brownfield properties, we can budget an addition of 700 or 77 million or 1%. It brings about $67,000 more than what we budgeted in FY22. So, 67,000 more, sorry, what yeah, was that 67, number? $67,000 more than what we were able to budget okay. prior. Now, in that category, we have, you know, money that comes from previous years, so it will look like there's a little bit more than that, but what we could do on actual property tax for the year as well as vehicle tax is only 67000 more. Sales tax you will see is 23.5% right now over uh, what we budgeted in FY22. And 12.6% um, is estimated over FY22. We are taking it two-year average, month by month, um, to budget the category where we you normally have done kind of year over year, 5%, 6%, is what we saw prior to FY19. Now we're changing our methodology and giving you current real-time increases, and that is what we saw. It totals about $7.6 million over the FY22 budget. And as a reminder, and I've said this a couple times, is that sales tax is lagged by 2.5, or three, point, three and a half months, keep going from dollars to months. Um, two, three and a half months, and so the next one will be January. We are watching month by month collections and how it's how consumer um, behaviors have been impacted, and this could change by the time we get to the recommended budget. Intergovernmental, I had stated that this is quarterly. Um, we are seeing uh, the some of the categories, telecommunications and video programming, were riddled with customer behavior changes. Those are still continuing. People are going to streaming videos um, over cable. They're going from cell phones over landlines. The one thing that did change during the pandemic, and I think it might just be a hiccup, is that the landlines were used a little bit more because people were at home and they needed to either homeschool. I'm, I'm not sure why, I don't have that exact reason, but it was a hiccup. We are seeing a little bit of an increase in that. Um, projections from the league are that is that could change quickly and depending on where the labor market does finally come to a stop. ABC revenue, I had stated that I'm able to put about a $750,000 more based on trends. And the Powell bill, I was able to restore some of that money that we didn't budget from prior years. So it did go up by about 6.2% over FY22's budget. And now for our favorite part, the forecasts. I made some assumptions and I have done this a little bit differently this year. I tried to go line item by line item. Um, property tax, even though we have the browns fields and the reevals, I do believe it's going to start to go back to normal as they come back online. We have more property coming back online, so I did put a 1.5% going in out years. Sales tax, I was thinking that the stimulus is going to eventually slow down and the inflation may slow down, but I don't know when that is, so I put 8% till FY25 and then 6% in FY26 and down to 5%, which is, has been historically prior to FY19, the growth rate that we saw for 27 and 28. Intergovernmental, I essentially did a 1.5% on the ones I had told you that were gaining, and then telecommunications, I started doing the negative there um, based on the trends. Charges for services are normally 1.5%, and then miscellaneous is usually just one, and those are the surprises. 
Laura, you, you, I hear this all the time, and I guess I'm a bit curious myself. Uh, the property tax growth, you know, the average person, and I'm one of them, you see all the construction that we approve here every other Tuesday night and the apartments that are going up and the, the just the sheer, you know, if we had a hell of a lot more land, we could have a hell of a lot more stuff. And to see the property tax forecast or, or what, what is actual, you know, in those numbers is kind of mind boggling. I don't know if I can explain why that happens. I know that we don't, obviously, until that property is online, we're not getting, we're only getting an amount that they're paying. Well, we've been like, doing completed. this, I mean, I, I, I've been back on council since 2009, and it's just a steady stream. In fact, that's always a, a campaign issue, too much growth. So it didn't just start. No. Go ahead. I'm waiting for your. I, I, I don't know how to explain that. It really only goes up about 2%. Um, the only time we see that change is when we actually make a reval and we change the percentage or we increase taxes. And mm -hmm. otherwise, it's, it remains pretty consistent. Thank you. Um, the expenditures, I put wages and not every wage uh, category. I think in the past we used grandiose categories that anything that fell in salary and benefits received a certain amount. Um, cell phones really remain the same. Uh, so I went through line item by line item, did kind of a logical one instead of the, the easy way um, that I did to save myself some time last year probably. I did, was a little bit grandiose. I put three and a half percent, assuming that that was what we're going to do for the future for wage and benefits for agencies. Um, they've historically increased by about two percent. And operating, I did those differently. Service contracts, we're seeing increase three percent now, so I put that in the future. Supplies, I put as two percent. Um, and then business travel, that stuff remains flat. And utilities, about two percent. And what that creates is FY23 is not um, balanced, and we come to you in March showing the difference between the needs of the city and the revenue. So this includes all of the department requests, includes the insurance that we know is going up, includes everything that we know of that goes into the budget, and we are $6 million more in operating than we have revenue. In the out years, we do see that we have um, 2 million, 1.5, or 1.1 million and so on going into the out years that we revenue won't cover. This one will help you, this slide will help you with regard to the enhancements. The first column I call the FY23 preliminary budget. This is the current complement. This is the insurance that we have to pay. This is, these are kind of like base operating. The things that we can't do without are in that first column. The second column are more of the enhancements that came from the city, and it does include the comp study on the last line. Um, we had $10.2 million of requests, and that's what brings us over to the $6 million that is over revenue. Is that a $28,000 enhancement to council and mayor council stipend? Yes, we put it on a three-year plan last year. So this is the second year of that plan. It went up 25% last year, 25% this year, and then next year we will be looking market-wide to see where we need to put it to get you to market. I, I realize we do a lot of work <coughs> up here, um, and you guys have done it for a lot longer than me. Uh, and that plan may have made a lot of sense last year, but 8% inflation, and I'm, I'm hitting it again, 8% inflation is hitting the citizens hard. And, and I think taking any sort of increase um, right now, and we're, again, proposing a tax increase, and, um, and we've got folks across the board that work for the city that, that we need to get increased. Uh, I think as leaders, we should, we should sit on the back burner here for any sort of increase, and, and I'll continue to advocate for that throughout the entirety of budget season. Stormwater is balanced um, at $14.7 million with all of the enhancements and um, the compensation study. What I want to be able to explain is that not all of those 10 million um, requests are valid or have merit in the situation that we have now. 
Um, we are vetting them one by one, um, looking at what the community needs, what the strategy of council is to make sure that the recommended budget that we bring back in May is very close to what council um, can appropriate or can adopt and so stormwater does have some enhancements in there They can with their revenue afford those enhancements But we are going through them and we are vetting them just as much as we do the general fund and that reigns true to all of the other funds I'll show you uh, We do have the 1% increase in their um, ERUs However, I wanted to make note that in FY 20, uh, 26, we are going to see an increase of a half a percent that is going to be needed, and that's going to have to be 1.25 cents or one, one and a quarter percent through FY 31 in order to do the planned um, construction that we have. This is a very heavy CIP fund, and they're going to need to have that increase to sustain what they have planned. Recycling and trash is balanced as well. They did a 5% across the board uh, rate increase based on the rate study that they had last year. They have a lot of ongoing needs just like the um, general fund. Their tipping fees are increasing. Their, their salary and benefits are increasing. Um, they have fuel costs and as well as you know just fleet needs that are increasing their budget and they need to be able to cover that. Parking is balanced at about $6.5 million. Um, we have a presentation forthcoming that will discuss their fee or rate increases. Um, DPAC does um, stand behind those rate increases and, and so that will be, I believe, right after lunch. And then golf is also balanced and it has the comp study in there. Um, revenues have continued to um, be higher than expected out there since the pandemic. Um, they're 290,000 more in revenue than prior year. Um, they are also suggesting a $2 um, green fee increase and they will be talking about that in their presentation later. Uh, and so I just wanted to let you know that it's balanced and uh, they have some money in reserve uh, that we will be able to use for maybe another CIP. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir, Ms. Spears. I, I just, I got to go back to what Councilman Waddell said. Sorry, Laura. You're fine. Um, I understand his point, where we are as leaders and where we go, the city of Wilmington goes. But we endure a lot in this position. And, and I'm not judging or, or, or looking at anyone else's finances that sit on that dice with me, but I think I may be the closest to the average working citizen in, in Wilmington, North Carolina. And we understand the seven or 8% inflation, but let's not give the impression that this job of council gives it looks way more prestigious than it is hard work it's a lot of hard work it's it's very demanding a lot of phone calls a, a lot of text messages a lot of reading a lot of being in the know a lot of being places, a lot of, I mean, let's be honest, I don't even think any of us could go to the grocery store, to the grocery store without having a 30 to 40 minute conversation about the aspirations or things that ail our community. And then you, a, a lot of people don't know that the, the pay is pretty low for what we do. That, that is supposedly a part-time job, but it's more like <laughs> a full-time job and a half. And a lot of you who are my fellow council members, you know, you have other endeavors. Uh, I do a lot of multitasking. 
and multitasking is putting it simple. So I, I just, I don't want to give our citizens the impression that when we give ourselves uh, a raise or an increase, that we're being selfish or that we're being greedy. I, I, I just wanted to put that out there. And I'm sorry, I, I, I was going to let it just ride out, but I, I couldn't. So, Kevin, on a lighter note, I think it's the only thing that we never get criticized on is our pay. Proceed. Yeah, <laughs> we don't. We if don't. you know what I mean, it's the only yeah, thing I, that I, I never I, hear I know, criticism I, on. Other than yeah, that. we never, we never, because I, I mean, you would think being in these positions as leaders, and I think television or, or the news or whatever doesn't really, it, it makes it seem like we're not on Capitol Hill, so we're not making what they make. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty small. So you're you're right, but I, I just wanted to put that out there. And and Luke, I I understand your stance, and you will advocate in the manner that you advocate. I, I just wanted to give a different perspective. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, I have already suggested some of the um, fee schedule highlights. I wanted to apologize. I wanted um, a document in your packet so you could see what all of those were. We will get that to you on a follow up. Um, so I won't go back through these. Uh, most of them will be discussed later. The one thing I do want to highlight is that we have a recommendation for the ticket surcharges from Live Nation. The city receives $2 at each of the venues. Um, they want to put one of those dollars into a committed revenue to ensure that we can pull those monies out and maintain the venues. Uh, I want you to have the scale of what that is. Um, $2 for um, the riverfront would be $288,000. So 144 of that would not be budgeted and would go, when it comes in, would go into the committed revenue. For Greenfield Lake Amphitheater, um, it would be an estimate of 80,000 this fiscal year. So 40 of that would not be budgeted for the general fund use and it would go into committed revenue. Is that taking consideration the added dates I'm sorry. Does that take into consideration on Riverfront Park, the added dates, the 10 extra dates? Yes. It does. Okay. Very good. And then the budget calendar, um, you guys are very familiar with this, but we have the presentation May, to May. We have a public hearing, the second meeting in May. The third meeting or fourth week in May, we also have a work session um, generally if council wishes. And then we have the adopted budget readings in June. And if you have any further questions, um, those are standing in between you and lunch. Okay. All right. Any further questions from council? Okay. All right, thank you, Laura. Thank you. We're gonna go ahead and then take a break for lunch, go ahead and get our lunch. Do you wanna come back and, and do a working lunch? Or do you all want to continue or do you want to um, take a break and have lunch? Okay. Cool. All right. We'll have a working lunch. Everybody will take a recess right now to get our lunch and then come back.
just go. Okay, we're back. I do need to do a road call since we are back. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, are you here? Okay, Councilman Ravenberg. Yes, sir. Okay, Councilmember Anderson is absent. Councilmember Barnett. Here. Councilmember Spears. Still here. here. Okay, Councilmember Waddell. Here. And the chair's here. Okay, we're all here and accounted for, and I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Caudill. Mr. Mayor, we're going to uh, bring Suzanne Gooding up to the podium uh, to do you do an update on uh, the CIP for you. Uh, she guarantees that the presentation won't be any more than about 90 minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's go. It'll be less than 90 minutes. Good afternoon. I'm Suzanne Gooding, the CIP coordinator with the city. Um, today we're going to walk through the FY23 uh, recommended projects, highlight those projects that have had funding changes or new information since the January work session. And um, as usual, you're welcome to give feedback and direction along the way. Um, and we have project managers ready if you need more details on a specific project. Before we go into this um, table of streets and sidewalks projects, just want to walk you through um, just the structure of the table. The most left column, um, or the second left column, the FY23 planned is those projects that were planned and published in the FY22 adopted budget. Um, you'll see adjusted amounts and then the FY23 recommended amounts as well as out year requests in FY24. Um, FY23 is the last year of the second CIP, whereas FY24 will be the beginning of a new capital improvement plan. So those amounts may change, the projects may change as that budget is developed. Also, any projects that are highlighted there, um, we'll have a slide and go over any new information or funding changes associated with those. The rest are as they were presented in January. So this is the um, one of two streets and sidewalks tables. If you see a B in front, which all of these do have, it means it's a bucket project, which is those projects that are um, larger maintenance type projects that focus on different maintenance needs throughout the city. Um, and here is the second streets and sidewalks table. Um, if you'll notice the 4th Street Bridge, Front Street Bridge, and Tolls Road projects have out year funds. Those are construction related funds, whereas the funding in FY23 is mostly related to design of those projects. Um, the Riverwalk has three projects up here. One is that Best Western Pier demo, um, Riverwalk North, which at the last council work session we didn't have a funding number, um, and we'll go over that in a second, um, as well as the Riverwalk South handrails replacement. Greenville Loop Sidewalk is located at Shenwood and Old Military. So streets and sidewalks for FY23 total $19.5 million. Sure. Just, just for clarity's sake, can you go back to that last slide? The Greenville Loop sidewalk, you said Greenville Loop Road in Shenwood. I mean, that's, that's just kind of like the focal point of it? I mean, because it's a... That location is at Shenwood and Old Military. Well, I mean, I mean, it's a, it's a, is that, that's part of the trail or is that... I believe it's separate from the trail. I can get engineering to provide you more details on that specific length and okay. all the details I on that project. To, I think that was the project that it was a public safety uh, issue with the kids. Um, mm -hmm. the it was brought street. forward by the community. Yeah, and they were having to cross the street at Greenville Loop Road, and they had blocked that. There was some individual that had blocked, I guess, an, an access point to get down to the crosswalk in front of Bradley Creek School, and since that has been blocked, the only recourse for these young kids is to come out on Greenville Loop Road, which is a heavily traveled road, and cross the street, and it was a dangerous situation. Could you leave that's, it that, yep, Denise? That's correct. Um, we were approached by some citizens. A bunch of neighborhood kids used to walk through some connected neighborhoods. Um, they were using a utility easement. The uh, property owner wasn't comfortable with the children crossing through their property for liability reasons um, and close that access. So then in order for the children to walk to school, they had to cross uh, Greenville Loop Road to get over onto the side of the road where the Safe Routes to School sidewalk was built several years ago. 
Um, this sidewalk would stretch from Shinwood to Old Military Cutoff on the south side of Greenville Loop Road, where it will connect to an existing sidewalk from Old Military to the crosswalk to the school. Okay. But it is, I mean, it is going to be, uh, it, it's kind of dovetails into the, the trail. It does, yeah. We're building the Greenville Loop Trail project on the north side. This sidewalk is on the south side. So this is a separate project altogether? The intention is if the timing works out with property acquisition, we're at about a 30% design on the sidewalk project. We're doing that in-house, so no um, funding is required to, to complete that design. The funding need comes in when we go to acquire right away and then construct that sidewalk project, which is why it's being considered in the FY23 budget. If the timing works out to where we can acquire the right of way in time, we would award, our intention would be to award this to the same contractor that's doing the Greenville Loop Trail project to build the sidewalk in conjunction. Okay. If the timing doesn't work out, then we would need to bid and award it as a separate project. Denise, do, do you know if, if this particular project on the chart here contains uh, a, a, a get, getting across Greenville Loop Road? Does it take them down to where the school crossing it is? It takes them down to where the existing school crossing is. And with the Greenville Loop Trail project, we're actually putting in a, an, a traffic signal at the school entrance with pedestrian signals so they'll cross at the school with the rest of the yeah. students. Well, we got to get them there. we got to get them there. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Thanks. Uh, Riverwalk North, at the January work session, we did not have any funding numbers. Um, at this point, and late last week, we've received some concept evaluations that are currently being reviewed by staff. We have a preliminary number of 6.5 um, going forward for FY23, and staff are currently evaluating that um, concept evaluation. So funding needs may vary based on that um, analysis of what came in. Um, Riverwalk South Handrails was a project that was planned for FY23 in the second CIP, but as project managers review cost estimates and scopes, it was determined that um, the way that this was originally scoped was kind of the older way that we did handrails on the Riverwalk, which had the rails and collars. Um, and the suggestion is to update that to the way we do newer sections, which is a whole system that attaches to the post, um, which requires less maintenance. That would require more funding at 741-400. But the, uh, the end result will be, it'll be a less expensive process to, to maintain, right? Yes, sir. So Dirt Street Paving, this came to you in January as a newly proposed bucket project that would allow for the project manager to develop a program over time to look at all dirt streets. Um, within that time period, they have identified six streets that are determined to be minimal stormwater improvements and kind of low-hanging fruit that we can look at first. Um, those total around one lane miles of the total 6.5 lane miles throughout the city that are dirt streets. Um, those streets are Donna Avenue, Gillette, Jones, Bailey Buck, Rogers, and Westbrook. Um, the $50,000, again, will need to accumulate in the project over time to get those started. Um, but it's a program that will we'll look at the whole city over time. Parks and Rec, that first project you see, the parks maintenance, uh, or parks facilities maintenance, is the bucket project for park facilities. Uh, Riverwalk maintenance is a newly proposed bucket project that stemmed from general fund um, money that came in in FY20 that was put in the operating budgets. The project managers have proposed that that be moved to a CIP so they can look at it throughout the year um, and over time and look at those Riverwalk maintenance needs. Olson Park Phase 2 is an expected New Hanover County revenue appropriation. Um, based on the city and county agreement um, years ago with Olson Park um, that originally was funded with Olson Park bond on the city side. So again, this is New Hanover County revenue expected um, at $1,034,050. Um, the original parks bond scope include included a multi-purpose field, pickleball or tennis courts, additional parking, maintenance structure, and paths. 
Could I ask, I'd like to ask a question. Could you go back? In, in respect to the river walk, and this is a question more of Tony or maybe John Joy, I know that we have an MSD that we've created for the downtown for the enhanced services. And as downtown continues to grow and prosper and what have you, and that, that continues to increase in revenue to the community, can we use any of that funding for any repairs on the Riverwalk? Because, because it is, it, it, is, it, is it, you know, it benefits downtown, it benefits the property owners downtown, it benefits a lot of the businesses downtown, and one of the things that we've always wrestled with is the cost of making improvements downtown seems to be a little bit higher than other places, especially with the Riverwalk. Um, and we're just wondering if we could use portions of that money in the future for this kind of stuff. Uh, one, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to sharpen my pencil and look a little bit deeper at it. it um, the MSD funds can't be used to provide just normal municipal services, the same level that the rest of the city would right. be getting. The MSD funds have to go to some sort of an added service, an enhancement. So to the extent that what we're doing is an added service or an enhancement, we, we should be able to use those funds. But I would need to look at the exact maintenance that we're taking care of. Are we maintaining something that is an enhanced no. Uh, piece of facility or infrastructure, or is it just the same old asphalt on the, the road? Uh, happy to look at that. Certainly understand what you're saying, that we've got those MSD funds and we'd like to be able to use them, and it is a tremendous draw to our area. So let us look at that, and we will certainly report back to council. That was, that was a big piece of contention, that it we had to... <clears throat> um, illustrate exactly to list what types of things services were being provided by the city and uh, my understanding was only things above and beyond that uh, in the CBD could which, be done which, which in this case <clears throat> for the upgrade to the rail the base cost to replace the rail would probably have to come from the general fund but the increased cost to improve the rail to the new standard might likely be able to come out of MSD funds. Well, I don't have any problem with that, but if you're already replacing railings along the river walk with the new railing, then that sort of begs the question. May have been an oversight on our part to this point in time. Okay. Um, so again, the Olson Park bond uh, funding is coming from New Hanover County. Um, in the public facilities fund, um, these are unchanged since the last time you saw them. Um, just a quick, you know, the building maintenance is a bucket project. The office space improvements are those that are, are downstairs in Thallion Hall. Um, City Hall Thallion Hall one is the third year of those interior renovations um, to, I believe the dressing room is scheduled for FY23. Fire station concrete repairs are driveway repairs at number eight and nine with headquarters scheduled for FY24. Um, parks and recreation maintenance facility had increased costs that were reviewed in January and a bucket project for generator replacements. Originally ADA compliance funding was scheduled for FY23, but that was moved out to FY24. Just as a note, I believe that the dressing rooms downstairs have already been completed, and that was a, a deal made that the city would somehow reimburse Salian Hall, the Center for Performing Arts. They actually had it designed by John Sawyer and did it. It's been used by the movie industry and so forth and so on, and there's going to be some sort of repayment or reimbursement through some other project or something like that. But my real question is, the City Hall and Thalian Hall, does that, any of that money include enhanced security? That For the City Hall, Thalian Hall, that's the third year of the three-year plan that's mostly focused on um, the interior renovations that I don't believe did in include security. City Hall office space improvements um, did have some security improvements, um, and I would have to get Dave Mays to comment on those specific I security details. I just think that's details. important this day and age that we, we've had several things happen, and I think it's important to ensure that our staff 
um, is safe. Um, part of the intent, we, we actually have an RFQ that just went out to hire someone to come in and do an, an assessment about security improvements that we need. It would likely involve uh, uh, another request that comes back. So the first step is to assess it and then come back with a, an updated request. We have an RFQ that just went out. It was just advertised yesterday, as a matter of fact, to, to have an architect come in and help us with some of the other interior things that we're doing uh, downstairs in City Hall, but it would in include that security assessment. I don't know if we had a line item for uh, painting chambers, but I think we got it done for free yeah. from, the, from the movie <laughs> theater, and it looks great. So that's one less thing. But we did have, in the, in the previous budget session, we had something about uh, purchasing new chairs that I hit pretty hard on. Did, we're, we're not doing that, right? That's on the requested but unfunded list. Um, and parking that is supported by the parking fund is the bucket project to replace the cameras at the parking decks and a Market Street deck major renovation. Stormwater, um, you see the stormwater rehab bucket project as well as Whispering Ponds for FY23. Uh, Kelly Road was originally planned for FY23 but it's been moved to FY25. Then overall, um, in the general fund, we see a $29.4 million um, CIP in FY23 with 353 in parking and $4.8 million in stormwater for a grand total of $34.5 million. Um, the out year number, of course, may change based on how the FY24 budget is developed in that next CIP that starts in FY24. And if you have any questions, be happy to get those for you. Thanks. Mr. Mayor, now we have a parking fee recommendation from Chance Dunbar. This has already been run through DPAC, so uh, this is for your consideration. Thanks, Tony. Uh, afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'll try to make this as exciting as possible for a uh, Friday afternoon. Um, as Tony mentioned, this is um, staff's parking fee recommendations for FY23, and also we are looking at FY24 and 25, so a three-year uh, incremental uh, recommendation. Uh, our last comprehensive uh, parking fee revisions were made in FY19 uh, three years ago. Uh, on average, uh, the city is below its municipal parking fee benchmarks, and we'll go through some of those cities that we look at um, each year when comparing. Um, we are recommending some incremental revisions over a period of three fiscal years, uh, just to be a little less impactful each year, but to ultimately get to uh, that end result. Um, these fees have been uh, presented to and are supported by the Downtown Parking Advisory Committee. Um, they looked at all three outlying years, um, as well as um, the current and uh, want to review it each year, but they are, they are right now in support of FY23 recommendations and, and the other two outlying years. And our recommendation is a start date of August 1st of 2022. Uh, if council does uh, adopt these fees into the fee schedule, uh, that will give uh, staff and our contractor time to just get uh, programming needs ready and signage out there before implementation. Uh, on the screen here, just a few of our municipal benchmarks that we look at when uh, comparing our parking fees uh, to others. Uh, Asheville, Alexandria, Charlotte, uh, Charleston, Chapel Hill, Durham, our, our regional beach communities, and Savannah. And uh, not on the list, but we also look at uh, Raleigh and Greensboro and Richmond, Virginia as well. So uh, little, little, these cities are a little bit different than Wilmington, but similar in size and scope. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the parking dynamics. 
So how do we compare? Uh, Wilmington currently is $1.50 per hour for our on-street meters. Our, our benchmark averages are $2.24 per hour at the meters. So right now we are 74 cents per hour less on average compared to our benchmarks. Uh, off street, uh, which is uh, really the, the main comparison here, are the market and second street decks compared to our benchmarks. Uh, we are currently uh, free for the first 90 minutes. Um, max daily rate at both of these parking facilities is $10 for 24 hours worth of parking. And our monthly fee, that contractual 30 day monthly fee, is $60. Uh, we are below that first hour or 90 minutes by $2.30 per hour compared to our benchmarks. Our max daily rate comparison is $16.78, so we are uh, down $6.78 for that daily max rate. And the monthly fee is, is, is a big variance here. Our average benchmark monthly uh, when looking at those benchmarks is $126 per month per parker. Uh, so we are $66 less uh, per month per parker on average. So what are the uh, staff recommendations here? Uh, first and foremost, we are, we are offering recommendations over a three year fiscal year period. Um, small incremental increases over three years. I think if we were to do this all at once to get close to our benchmarks, uh, it'd be pretty impactful to everybody, visitors, merchants, you know, everybody. So we kind of divided these recommendations up into three fiscal years and, and, and spread out a little bit, a little bit smoother. Uh, recommendation for on-street meters is 50 cents per hour per year. So that would leave FY23 at $2 per hour and ultimately end at $3 per hour during FY25, so 50 cents per year. Market and Second Street decks, uh, this is a big one here um, and was discussed thoroughly at DPAC, is the removal of the first one hour free and replacing that with the, the first one hour at the Market and Second Street decks to $1 for the first hour. Uh, the max rate at both of these decks would be $12 FY23, ultimate leading to $14 max rate FY25. Uh, evening flat rate, an increase from five until seven, and then ultimately landing at eight three years from now. Uh, the monthly parking fee, the one with the biggest variance, um, our recommendation is to increase that from 60 to 75 in FY23. Uh, skip a year and then another increase in FY25 at $90. And the reserve monthly fee, similar to the monthly rate, uh, $15 extra in FY23, $125 versus $110. Skip a year and then FY25 up to $140. So basically $15 or $30 spread over three years. I'm good. Uh, the second Hannah Block lots, um, similar uh, to the market and uh, Second Street facilities, max 24-hour fee of $12, FY23, skip a year, FY25 up to $14. Um, the flat weekend fee will also go up to $12 next year and $14, FY25. And that flat weekend fee is Friday night, all day Saturday, all day Sunday. So that would be the cost to park there on Friday night or all day Saturday or all day Sunday. Uh, monthly fee, exactly like the other two facilities, 75 next year, skip a year up to 90 in FY25. And the convention center, uh, what we're looking to do at the convention center, our recommendation is really to clean up that fee structure. Uh, it's it's, it's kind of confusing how it's set up now. It's been that way since 2010, hasn't been touched. Um, so ultimately looking to clean up that fee structure uh, with, a, with a, one of the biggest changes just going from $13 max rate up to 15 and the max special event rate going from 13 up to 15 and then next year going from 15 to 20. And last but not least, River Place parking deck. Um, this is a newer facility. Uh, we, we did a pretty thorough review when we recommended these fees to uh, council three years ago, I believe, and we are much closer to the benchmarks at this facility than we are at the others. 
Um, so the recommendation here is to uh, no changes in FY23, and then in FY24, uh, increase the max fee from 13 to 14, and FY15, uh, excuse me, FY25 up to 15. And then also just look at increasing the reserve monthly fee from 150 where it is currently up to 175 in FY25. Now these are just kind of high level highlights of some of the recommendations. Uh, there's quite a few other incremental changes in, in the fee schedule, but just wanted to go, to go through some of the bigger, bigger and high level ones here. What is um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions, uh, yeah, comments, gonna, or look for some directions. I just got one. What is the convention um, center fee right now? Uh, <laughs> the convention center daily fees uh, are three dollars for the first hour, five dollars for the second hour, okay. seven dollars for the third hour, okay. and then it's a dollar per hour up to I think eleven or twelve hours. So it's three, five, seven. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, maxes out at 13. And so you think what we're saying here is, like if I go in for an event, something happening at the convention center, um, I pay $15? No, what we're recommending here, Councilman, is uh, that was just kind of the, one of the highlights of the convention center. Uh, what we're looking to do at the convention center is to um, kind of restructure what I just said, the three, five, seven, eight, nine to three, five, seven, nine, eleven, fifteen. Okay. So we're just condensing those structures uh, and getting to that fifteen a little quicker. Okay. Okay. Uh, the numbers we ran on that one, it it, it's, it won't be very impactful to those uh, convention center events. It's pretty much a break even revenue wise. Um, the biggest one that, that's going to bring revenue in at the convention center there is just that event rate, which is geared toward uh, those Live Oak Bank concerts on the north end. Thank you. Chase, all, all the private lots, all the private lots that are out there, they're charging higher rates, are they yes, not? Yes, sir. What are the, just out of curiosity, because I get calls thinking that there are lots, and I'm like, oh, I wish we were making that kind of money, but can you kind of tell us what are these rates on these private yeah, lots? Yeah, and because I'll, they're, I'll they're echo a, a majority of my phone calls are related to private lots. Those lot. half a dozen or, dozen or so private lots. I think they range from about $4 per hour up to 5 and 6 depending on what time of the year. Okay. Uh, I think an example, the, the private lot at the corner of Princess and uh, Water Street right there next to River Place is right. currently $5 per hour. $5? They got rice for beach prices there. Huh? So big, big difference there. But do they stay full? They seem um, like they stay full most of the time. Uh, not most of the time. Okay. Yeah, I, I think uh, a lot of our customer base downtown uh, that are aware of the parking fees are, are pretty price sensitive and will navigate toward the public side if they are aware of those fee differences. Okay. Chance, how long did it take you or your staff to put this little this presentation together? I mean, to, not to put it together, but to get the information that is in it. Um, in terms of the research of the rates and fees? Mm -hmm. Um, not long. Uh, I mean, I've got a pretty good working relationship with some parking colleagues in the state and other cities. Um, a lot of times it's phone calls, some quick web research. I mean, my point you, is, you, it, it's not something that takes two or three or four or five months to put together. No, sir. So I, I would, I would recommend doing this at least once every year or two, just to keep us up. I find that it's easier to go up incrementally than it is to wait four or five years and then go up. It shocks people. Yes, sir. And the other thing, there are some parking spaces that we have, and you and I have had a conversation about a couple of them, but there are parking places that don't have meters. They just have signs that says one-hour parking or whatever. There needs to be some better enforcement on those because, I mean, people, human nature, just they take advantage of that. They'll park there and just leave it there all day. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Chance. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It, it, here's, here's where we should be not trying to compete with others, right? With everything we see, like Councilman Waddell has been speaking about all morning, uh, inflation and, and prices and, and things of that nature. Here's, here's a, a, a small thing where for, I don't know, a period of time, we could just remain the same. Or maybe if we go from 90 minutes of free parking to one hour of free parking, and then we charge a rate. But, you know, we don't, we don't want to get the same flack that 
Carolina Beach gets about parking or Wrightsville Beach gets about parking. You know, we 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 do want our citizens to to buy in and believe that we're we're not at every opportunity trying to just pull another nickel from wherever we can pull it from. So, I mean, and, and my other question is this, well, that wasn't a question, but here, here's my, my question for parking fees and parking deck and all of that. Where directly does that money go to? Uh, great question, Councilman Spears. Um, first response, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. We, we, we don't want to be uh, Wrightsville Beach, Carolina Beach, or Curie Beach. Um, I think their last increase went from $2 per hour up to five. Um, big, big difference there. That's why we're looking to incrementally increase these, just small increments, 50 cents per year. Um, and the second response, great question, where, where do these fees ultimately go? First and foremost, we pay the expenditures each year and balance the budget. Uh, anything over those expenses each year go into the parking reserve fund. And those parking reserve funds are kind of held back for uh, structural repairs and technology improvements, growth in, in the parking geographic areas. And a good example is uh, right across the street at the Second Street Parking Deck, we currently have a $2 million rehab project going on for a facility that's now 30 years old. And as I was telling the manager recently, we could easily put in quarter of a million to half a million dollars a year into that facility alone, uh, just based on the age, the condition, the salty air. So um, unlike some of our beach communities, we do have structured facilities um, that are gaining in age. So a majority of these increases uh, ultimately are going to help uh, get our parking fund where it needs to be to maintain our facilities over the course of the next 5, 10, 15, 30 years. Thank you. Yes, sir. I I'll just say one quick thing since I now am downtown that I think we started giving away parking when we were trying to get people to come downtown. And we did the bring it downtown and we had so many years of just almost begging people to come downtown. Downtown is alive and well. There is no shortage of people coming downtown. I was out on Water Street and within about 40 minutes, there were over 100 people last weekend walking back and forth from the hotels, from the Cotton Exchange, wherever, up up until trying to get to Front Street. There, there's no shortage of, of people downtown now. It is definitely alive and well, and I, I think the time to give away parking has passed, and we have commitments um, to, to pay. That's why we have meters on the streets, to pay for the, the decks, and we've, we have loans out that we've, we've got to pay for. So I'm, I support what you're doing. I think it's a good idea and I like the incremental uh, increases, but at the time to give away parking has passed in my opinion. I'll just follow up quickly to, to Mayor Pro Tem, uh, that yeah, I, I agree that downtown is back in a big way. Um, and all that traffic, uh, folks parking in all these parking decks, uh, it, it, it wears quickly on the infrastructure that we have, and that's what, that's what this funds uh, the, the repairs and the significant repairs that we have to do year over year. So uh, I commend you for pulling this together. It's a phenomenal presentation and, uh, and making not too aggressive uh, recommendations, but recommendations that will get us closer to market where we can uh, keep our infrastructure intact. We got a lot of parking to build downtown, and I think that we we've all have been approached by different groups and people, and saying we need more parking here, we need more parking there, and this is one way that we fund that. And without parking, structured parking, especially in an urban setting like downtown, you're not going to be able to support the businesses nor the tourists that are coming down here. I do like the fact that DPAC, which is a which is a group of citizens that we appoint. Uh, that are very reluctant to do any kind of rate increases and have been very sensitive to the business needs and the community's needs have gone along with this program. And, and to your point, Chance, I like the fact that you're doing it incrementally instead of shock and awe, as they would say, 
where we have seen the beach communities catch a lot of raft because they've moved it to $5 an hour. And I want to eventually say that they'll probably push it beyond that. But I think this is these are good incremental small moves for us to make so that we can make the money necessary to take care of the infrastructure that we do have with the possibility of bringing in more structured parking in the future but also taking into consideration like and I know you come you came from Baltimore Maryland and in Baltimore they use some of that parking fund that they generate for affordable housing and other issues where one of the, we have a unique situation here in the county of New Hanover I think Tony you may have been involved in this many years ago when you were the manager down at Ice Beach where we can use our parking fund besides just parking if if we were to get an excess of revenue that we could use it for other things uh, for social programming and stuff like that which is unique and different than any other part of the state but this is one of the few places that we can make some adjustment and make revenue for the city as well as make sure that we take care of the parking necessary to support what's happened in downtown because now we do have two bookends in New Hanover County we have this vibrant downtown that is attracting a lot of tourists and we've got the three area beach communities that are also bring in a lot of tourists that spend a lot of money for sales tax in sales tax revenue in our community that helps us offset the cost of delivering services to our citizens so I think it's incremental I think it's slow but I think it's it's been due and, and, and to Margaret's point based on what I have seen walking downtown you can't find a parking space especially on the street on Saturdays and Sundays uh, down here it's it's incredible the amount of people that are down here so um, folks are doing good good work down here so I, I congratulate you on, on on doing this in a very um, uh, precise and a very slow manner but making certain that we're making the adjustments necessary to, to add to the infrastructure I, I was curious you made a comment about spending a quarter of a million dollars just on the second street deck here because of the age of it I know that we've made some repairs over the last couple of years yet. You alluded to the fact of $2 million. Yeah, we're currently in the middle midst of a rehab project uh, that's going to total right around $2 million. Yeah. Um, that was kind of to get us to a, yeah. a good even point yeah. of the age of that facility. But, yeah, we could easily put an additional quarter million into that facility each yeah. year. And at the same time, Market Street is starting to age yeah. uh, 17 or 18 years old now. And, and Suzanne's presentation earlier, we're, we're starting to, to, to look at planning for some rehab projects there as well. And, and I know sometimes when we, when we talk about enterprise funds and people, you know, <coughs> some people understand it, some people don't. But the enterprise fund, I remember when this discussion was hashed way back about bringing structured parking in downtown Wilmington, one of the things that came out of that discussion at debate many years ago was the fact that the property owners outside of downtown that were reluctant to support any kind of funding for parking said no to that, were basically very vocal about that. So the city council in its conventional wisdom at those days said, we're gonna create an enterprise fund just like we do with the golf course um, and other things that will say that the users of parking will pay for the parking as opposed to the property taxpayer because of concerns of people with fixed incomes, older residents that say, I don't want that to go to that. Just like we do with beach renourishment, and the room occupancy tax pays for the beach renourishment instead of putting it on the property tax owner. It's just a, one less thing the property tax owner has to maintain and take care of, which I think is a good public policy uh, moving forward. Because the people that are coming down here don't just live in the city of Wilmington. They live in the county of New Hanover, they live in the county of Brunswick, Pender, other parts. People come into our community and it's the only way that they can generate any kind of revenue to claw some of that money back in regards to some of the service delivery that we are, that we're having to provide for, for, for different parts of downtown. So I appreciate it. Good work. Yes, sir. Thank you. Next, Mr. Caudill. Thanks, Chance. Mr. Mayor, next we've got an update on the Wilmington Municipal Golf Course, and Amy Beatty, our Community Services Director, will provide that overview. Good afternoon, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and City Council. Um, acknowledging that over the past two or three years, there have been discussions among staff and City Council over um, 
how Muni operates um, and specific conversations about indirect charges um, back to the general fund um, and unmet capital needs. Um, staff wanted to present with you today to uh, provide you an analysis of some benchmarks um, and discuss the overall financial condition of the golf course and make some recommendations to you. So for everyone's background, particularly the public, um, the golf course uh, has been an enterprise fund since 1995. And as the mayor was just describing during the last presentation, that means that the golf course users pay for the operation of the golf course. It's not subsidized by the general fund. Um, and therefore, uh, the, the budget must balance, um, revenues must meet uh, expenditures. And is, as standard uh, government practice, that means that Muni pays indirect costs. So in other words, they pay proportionally back to the general fund for the internal support services that it is receiving, such as finance, IT, um, and administrative time from the community services department, um, uh, for example, such as uh, marketing, which is handled uh, out of community services. And there are, across North Carolina and the country, a lot of variances when it comes to how golf courses are operated. Um, some are complete subsidies out of the general fund, some are enterprise funds, some are um, operated internally, some are um, outsourced to third party um, operations. So knock on wood, we're in the third year of year-over-year -year record revenues um, at Muni. Um, collections through February of this year uh, mean that we are uh, $70,548 to the good of the same period last year. We uh, ended uh, fiscal year 21 with fund balance um, at 38% um, of the general fund. And at the end of fiscal year 22, that jumped to $791,881, which is 43%. And that has allowed us to start chipping away uh, at some of the unmet capital needs. Um, earlier this fiscal year, city council um, approved appropriations for, to replace the irrigation pump and control center uh, and uh, implemented a, or installed a gold tea project. However, it is important to note that there are um, deferred maintenance and high dollar capital projects that are uh, looming on the horizon, and that includes replacing the irrigation piping underground, uh, which is I think 25 plus years old now, um, building a cart barn and replacing uh, cart paths. With the support of the Golf Course Advisory Board, uh, staff is recommending for the fiscal year 23 budget a 2% increase in greens fees. Uh, this is supported by the rate study that was completed last year and presented to council. The last increase was three years ago. Um, as uh, Chance was relaying in his presentation, um, we also want to take the approach of incremental uh, increases. Uh, we would anticipate, um, unless some unforeseen circumstances, having moderate increases of one to two dollars every one to two years, uh, like I said, if needed. Uh, I will note that uh, capital projects are currently uh, either in the form of grants or loans from the general fund. So while our uh, uh, unassigned fund balance is healthy. Like I, I said previously, it doesn't support some of those deferred maintenance um, projects. So here is our benchmark analysis. Um, I'm not going to read this to you, um, but if you have any questions, please let me know. David Donovan is also in the audience, and he um, can also answer any questions that you have. But there is no one size fits all um, when it comes to how public golf courses are operated. Like I alluded to before, um, there is a mix of enterprise and general funds. There's a mix of internal operations versus third party. I am pleased to be able to, to um, demonstrate to you that in looking at our benchmark cities, Wilmington is doing very well. 
You'll see that there are some uh, courses on here that are operating at a deficit that includes Goldsboro, uh, Greensboro, and High Point. Um, you'll also note on here that there is a wide variety of um, revenues of uh, rates of play and, and rounds of play. And so you have everything from, say, a Greensboro where uh, the standard may be a little bit lower and that standard is acceptable to the players uh, and to the city of Greensboro all the way to a course like Charleston, where you can see they collect 3.2 million in revenue every year. They have the highest number of rounds every year, course in good condition, they have a full service grill. So again, this is just to demonstrate across the spectrum, there's a variance in types of operations um, and that Wilmington by and large is doing, is doing very good. I apologize, we were not able to get one data point, um, and that was uh, the city of Greenville. We were not able to um, receive input on amount, if any, uh, funds are paid to the, to the general fund. We included Tarpon Springs, Florida, uh, as a benchmark because it, until recently, it was operating most similarly to um, Wilmington in terms of the amount of dollars it was paying back to the general fund. They did cease payments to the general fund in 2020 uh, due to a backlog of loans that, that was owed to the general fund. Um, again, I alluded to uh, general fund, although um, Muni is an enterprise fund for large-scale capital projects. Um, those have been subsidized or loaned um, to Muni, and notably they include the Greens uh, renovation or replacement project uh, in 2014. That was almost a million dollars. And then the recently completed um, clubhouse renovation project, um, 1.2 million from the general fund. That was from the 2016 Parks Bomb. And then there's other types of general fund support um, that are, are smaller but are still being um, completed through the general fund. As an example, tree removals, um, particularly with the hurricanes over the past five years, um, all of that work has been done by the city's tree section. We also have public services um, facilities that provide some um, maintenance and repair projects um, to the course. Wrong way. That slide might have been in there twice. So in summary, um, again, there's, there's not a one-size-fits-all um, in types of operations. You saw a mix of enterprise and general fund courses. Um, anecdotally, um, I can say through our research, we have found that uh, third-party transitions to third-party operations um, proved to be, by and large, um, unsuccessful. Um, there are benefits uh, to the citizens of Wilmington who are not users or players at Muni um, in terms of, number one, preservation of open space, which is important um, in a densely, um, a, a dense county like New Hanover County in the city of Wilmington, and then just the visibility of the city, um, the course being a Donald Ross course, a historic course, a course that gets a lot of play. We do receive a lot of play from um, out of town. We also uh, want to note that customers have been more receptive to fee increases in recent years, and I think will continue to be, especially if we, if we adopt the um, incremental um, $1 to $2 increases um, every one to two years. And I think that's attributable to the condition of the course, um, which is you know, what we've heard from feedback from customers is, is the best in modern history. Um, and uh, I'd say also, I think our consumer base has expanded a bit. Um, uh, we're having some younger play out there as well, and so I think that also is just lending to a general acceptance of, um, of moderate increases. Um, so we will continue to solicit feedback from customers um, on you know, what, how they would like to see Muni grow and operate. Um, keep fees as low as possible and um, 
you know, treat it more or less as an amenity, or do they want all the bells and whistles, um, such as a full service grill and, and things of that nature, which would require um, a little bit more than modest fee increases in the future. One recommendation that's not in the presentation, but I wanted to suggest to council, given the fact that um, our large capital needs have been traditionally funded by the general fund, one recommendation would be to continue to pay the amount of indirect funding um, that has been budgeted and was most recently reviewed by an independent third party, uh, I believe in, in 2019. Keep those, but when they are collected, put them in a committed fund that goes towards capital improvements at the golf course. And I think that would ally uh, the golf course advisory board's frustrations <laughs> that they've exhibited um, with having to pay these fees um, because they would in, in stay with the, the, with the golf course for all intents and purposes and go towards um, those unmet capital needs. Aren't they being collected though to repay for um, sort of intangible city support services? They are. So, like I said, they get the, the reason for being of them is to pay for internal support for things like finance and IT. However, given the fact that the way the city has funded capital improvements in the past, those have come from the general fund. So, we're trying to make that link. Yeah, I noticed that most of the other courses don't do that. They don't pay something back. It's just part of the that's uh, what we on, found, on and I was a little bit surprised by that, but you're correct. That's what we found. To, to me, one of the most significant, and this is all great. It's all good news. Um, to me, one of the most significant things is the footnote on page five that all of the other golf courses have a driving range except for Wilmington. And um, I keep talking about that, which apparently falls on deaf ears, but we did hire a golf course consultant who I guess helped with some of this stuff initially and one of his recommendations was that we somehow come up with um, a driving range, a municipal driving range because there are a lot of people that don't have all day to play golf but really enjoy going out and practicing and refining their game and getting out their aggressions by hitting a bucket of, of golf balls. And there's really nowhere to do that now unless you're a member of a private country club. And um, I think that's really unfortunate and we have lost the ability to put a driving range right next to the municipal golf course where the old public driving range was. And I think that was uh, unfortunate and I, I would like to see us see if we can't work in some way towards having a, a driving range that the city sponsors. And perhaps that could be part of the enterprise fund. Might, might not be right next to it, but it could still be part of the enterprise fund. People certainly will pay to go and, and do that as they do in all other communities. So I think it's a shortcoming. I think we hired and paid for a consultant. That was their recommendation. And I would, um, Maybe it's because I'm the only one talking about it, but um, you know, like some of these gentlemen to maybe chime in on that and support me, uh, so we could perhaps in the future move forward on that. Thank yes, you. Well, I, I want to comment on that. You're not by yourself. I mean, right. David Donovan's sitting out there in the audience. We've always looked, tried to look at ways. First tee, which was so worthy, more or less took the space that we could have put a driving range. And you know you would have to have a shoehorn right now to I mean just just lack of property, and the McCrays you know that they were certainly asked, believe it or not, about their property there on Oleander Drive, the old driving range. It didn't work, and we didn't apparently have the wherewithal to step up to the plate and purchase it. That would have made the most sense. Um, the gentleman who is uh, Ted Hilbron or Halbron, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name the developer of the Starway multifamily. What he did in his previous life was he developed uh, driving ranges all over the country, two and three stories. He said that's what happens in places like this where the land is at a premium and there's a scarcity of it, you go up. Absolutely. And, and here in Wilmington, it, you would need, I don't know how many acres, I, I don't know how many acres it was at the McRae property, but it had to be at least 15, 20 acres. Where are you gonna find 15 or 20 acres you know, in the city limits of Wilmington 
to build a driving range. Uh, it's just, I mean, it's just supply and demand. But we certainly need it. You go out there to play around the golf, you can't loosen up. You can't, you know, we usually hit a small bucket on the first tee <laughs> <laughs> trying to get loosened up. But, I mean, it's just, it's a problem. And uh, the, 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 the consultant can say it all day long, but, you know, the reality sets in, we don't have a place to put it. And that first tee program, I'm not knocking it. It's, it's worthy. I go out there in the afternoons and watch those kids out there playing that probably would never, ever be on a golf course in their entire life. And it's, it's wonderful to see that. So, Thank you. My, uh, my wicked slice could use some time on the driving range, no doubt. Um, and I've yelled four quite a few times out there at the Muni. Um, and my guys that I'm out there playing with love to yell it as soon as I hit the ball. But um, <laughs> I... We have a really incredible and special amenity at the Muni. I've played some other municipal courses in that, you know, I wouldn't let my dog run around on them. We've got really an incredible uh, amenity there, and we, we take care of it. I think all the, all the folks that, that play it uh, will be happy to pay a couple more bucks, you know, to make sure that it's, uh, it's, it's taken care of properly. Uh, I, I know I will and, and, and the folks that I play with. And it's, it's a different type of community atmosphere out there. I've, I've been out there playing with me and a friend and, uh, and you know, a dad has driven in from Jacksonville with his daughter who's, you know, maybe in middle school on the golf team. And this girl drug me up one side and down the other all over the golf course. But it's just a cool spot where anybody can come out and play. And it, it's good for the game of golf, but I think it's really great for our community. So I'm happy to see us taking, uh, taking efforts to improve it and make sure we maintain it well thank you thank you for your comments i appreciate that and i really want to commend um our staff david donovan and um and matt smith um since matt's come on board a few years ago i think he's taken the condition of that course to a different level um and i failed to mention before and I'll, i can kind of tie into it now um you, you you can see a couple of these on here that are contracting out to a third party, how affordable that is. But I think um, no slight to either of those two operations, but I think you get what you what you pay for. And I know right now Asheville's course um, is suffering uh, through some sinkholes that are very significant. They have um, certain areas of the holes that are, are roped off because they're unsafe to, to walk on. And, you know, Asheville is now looking at uh, up to a four million dollar project to to correct that, whereas maybe if there were more vested eyes looking at that, you know, before it got to the state that it was in, that it could have been um, repaired more affordably. When when that course used to be funded out of the general fund, nobody knew what it was making, nobody knew this, nobody knew that, and in the mid nineties, it, it became a uh, enterprise fund, and it's it's spelled all the difference. Uh, to me, the course is in much better shape. I've been out there since I was small, and it's just a, it's a the people that that go there on a regular they feel like that's their club. I mean, that, they feel like they have a, a an understood membership, uh, and we have our our advisory committee, which this body appoints, and we make very sure that we put people on that committee that that are committed to to Muni, and they play it, and they understand it, and I take their comments very seriously. And they need, you know, they, they have grand vision for things to go out there. Then there's Friends of Muni, the, the private group, and they do fundraisers all the time, and, and, and they put every bit that they make right back into the course. So, I mean, it's not like it's, it, they're just waiting for us to do everything that we do. Um, but, you know, I, whatever we can do to, to honor their wishes, the irrigation is extremely important. They used to drag hoses around. Now we've got an irrigation system and it needs to be updated. And the cart paths, we didn't have cart paths until the mid 90s. So it, it's, it's come a long way, so keep at it. Hey, Amy, just a, a question. In respect to the, the driving range, um, I understood that on the um, west side of the drive, there's some property that backs up to some houses there along Oleander Drive now, I don't know how wide it is, but the golf course advisory group or commission had evaluated possibly putting a, a driving range in that location. First of all, is there enough land to do that? And can, can it be accomplished? Can it be done? There's enough land to do 
some type of caged hitting area. I would don't know that I would call it a driving range because okay. I don't know if you're going to have the length or the or the width necessary to do much more than a chip shot maybe, but it's um, something that the Friends of Muni has come to us with. Um, it did not rank on the Golf Course Advisory Board's top 10 list of priorities, um, but I'm certainly happy to bring that up at a future Advisory Board meeting and have that discussion, and we can have staff start to look into the feasibility um, that is city-owned property. I just want to make sure that it's zoned the same thing that the golf course is, and then um, see what type of facility we could get out of there and then um, try and put some cost estimates to that. And then the second question is um, on the first tee property where we have the netting, and I know the first tee made the significant investment in, in putting that together. Could you use that in conjunction, if you worked it out with the first tee group, to be able to drive balls because it's just basically driving the balls. Obviously, you'd have to have a machine of some sort to be able to pick up the balls. Could you do it there if First Tee would allow it? We could look at that. You know, we, I think we've had some conversations about that, and we would want that to be staffed in some way, whether that be by a volunteer or we have new city positions or First Tee agrees to do it for a fee. I think what we wouldn't want to have is just anybody going out there and, you know, sure. unsupervised and potentially damaging the, the turf. But we're, I'm happy to um, have conversations with First Tee about but that. But y'all have had some conversations? Very about, high level. Very high level? With the previous um, board chair and previous um, uh director at the staff level. So there's been changeover in both of those positions. So these would be new conversations with them, but we can do that. Were they receptive to it? Um, at a concept level. Because, because obviously they could generate some revenue for their organization by allowing it. Mm -hmm. Obviously we don't want to damage the turf and the investment that they have made in the facility there. But if it can be done without damaging it, I think it'd be, it could be a win-win for the city for the players as well as the organization there first tee to be able to generate revenue. Just um, and of course the hours would have to be limited due to their programming. The, their on-site programming has increased um, a lot since um, their new director came on board. So hours would be limited, but yeah, we're happy to have those conversations. Okay. I'll just say quickly, if, if all we can come up with is some sort of caged facility for <laughs> chip shots, I don't think it's worth it. I think, you know, you've got to have a, a driving range, even if you had four stations double stacked. And I have some beautiful pictures, and I've done that up um, where my son lives, up in Arlington, Virginia. Absolutely marvelous. It's computerized. You know, kids, listen, my 11-year-old granddaughter can hit the ball almost as far as I am and immediately looks at the TV screen to see how far <laughs> it went. You know, and what it's like TV. It's like you're watching golf on television. It's amazing what you can do when you want to. I think so. Well, we'll see what, what, how much land is available to play with out there. Not knowing that, not having done the, the homework yet, I, I don't want to come up here and over promise and undersell. So the, the other <laughs> thing would be economic development to find somebody to bring Top Golf to Wilmington at some other location. I'm, I'm on board. <laughs> Since we're, since we're You're here. coming out with all these ideas, um, I, 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 do know, I do know that Denise and, and has been working on that project there with the new turn signal at Pine Grove, and there's going to be an abandoned section there. Is that correct, Denise? Of some sort, and I don't know what the length of that is, next to Longleaf Park, you know, between the stoplight that's currently there now and going back to some distance, I don't know if there's enough space there, but <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just thinking. It's a, there is a small triangular property that will be left when we realign the south leg of that intersection a little bit further um, to the east. There'll be a triangular piece of property in there. We've got some um, stormwater infiltration that's planned to go into that triangular space. I don't know that it would be large enough okay. for that type of facility. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Mr. Manager, is this it? 
We got accounting. Mr. Mayor, we saved the best for last. Okay. Uh, we've got a GASB update for you. Uh, we understand that this is the only thing sitting between you and the weekend, so uh, I'm sure Ms. Moretti will be uh, relatively brief. It's nap time. <laughs> okay. Um, good afternoon. We want to bring a um, few changes that have come our way um, thanks to GASB, which is the Government Accounting Standards Board. They've made a couple changes that will impact how we report our financial data as well as impact our budget appropriations. So the first one that we're dealing with this year is GASB 87 and has to do with leases. These changes apply to a leasee and a leaseor arrangement. Prior to GASB 87, most leases were identified as an operating expense for the annual lease amount. With the changes required for this standard, we will have to identify all leases and treat them as a long-term liability. So what that means is as for a lessee where we are leasing property or equipment from a third party, will be required to recognize the lease liabilities and the right of use asset, similar to how we recognize a long-term financing arrangement in place of the annual operating expense. So when we purchase a, a large piece of equipment and we finance it, we have that asset on our books and then we have to book the principal and interest payments to pay back that financing every year. This is how these leases are gonna be treated on our financial statements. The exception to GASB 87 is when a lease is short term, which means it's no longer than 12 months, or when we're in a lease to own arrangement, which that is then considered a capital lease. Um, so there's no change to that. Now there's not a differentiation, it's just all um, leases have to be treated the same way. And from a lessor perspective, when we're leasing property to a third party, we'll recognize the present value of the lease as a long-term receivable and the deferred inflow of resources where currently we only recognize the annual lease revenue. This is effective with the current fiscal year 22 financial reporting period and is also retroactive for all current leases. So staff has had to go, go through and identify all the leases we have and review the terms to determine the impact to the financial statements and any necessary adjustments we need to make for this year. What will be different is that instead of recording the current operating expense for the annual cost of the lease, we'll be recording a debt service principal and interest payment. Again, similar to how we do a financing arrangement. This change will impact our budget, which is why we're bringing this to your attention. For all new leases, we will have to have a budget appropriated for the value of the lease for the total term. The budget will include a revenue as another financing source and an expense identified as a purchase of an asset. The revenue and expense appropriation will net to zero, but will increase our budget appropriation total. Council will be asked to approve a budget ordinance that staff will bring forward in June that will appropriate the budget for all new leases entered into the dur during the current fiscal year period. For all existing leases prior to the current year, we have to adjust the budget by moving it from the operating section down to a principal and interest section of the financial statements. For new leases that we have with our fiscal year 23 budget, we'll bring forward any necessary budget appropriation to council to approve in July when we're able to have all the costs identified that will not be ready for the fiscal year 23 budget adoption. This will also include adjusting the budget to move from the operating ex expense section down to principal and interest. Following this, anytime we enter into a new lease, we'll have to bring a budget appropriation to council um, for them to, uh, for you to approve that budget related to those leases. And then as if that's not fun enough, next year we get to deal with GASB 96, which will be doing the exact same thing, but for software licenses, which GASB is describing as subscription-based information technology arrangements. 
So this will be the similar um, accounting impact as we are experiencing with GASB 87 this year, and it is effective next year. Um, so we'll be bringing additional appropriations for you going forward to deal with this. So the reason we wanted to bring it to you is when you see these appropriations come to you that you hadn't seen before, it's related to these GASB statements, and we'll have to appropriate the budget to be able to um, pay for those expenses. So that's it. <laughs> and and you're, you're up on these um, changes, and you're going to keep us out of jail. Absolutely. All right. That's our Thanks job. <laughs> I trust you. All right. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Well, Jennifer, was this, was this done at the federal level? Um, what this is trying to do is so um, for GASB is for governmental, and then FASB is what all the private um, companies follow. This is trying to align the financial statements for governments with the private sector. Um, eventually, they're trying to go with the international and, and align all of them to some respect to where the readers are seeing the same information um, from, from one entity to another. So FASB or, or federal or different private entities are already doing this. So this is for any governmental agency will have to follow this one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Manager, this is the end of the day. Anything? It, it is, but I have some important information okay. for Thank you. you. Uh, when we gave you the information on the uh, pay plan update, you had asked some, for some questions. You'd asked some questions about uh, how much was the average. Um, Clayton and the folks over in HR have done some calculations. I want to give these to you relatively quickly, and we can bring these back to you, or you can act on them, or whatever you choose to do. The average increase proposed by the pay plan for all city employees is 9.5%. If you instituted a pay plan adjustment that started ahead of July 1, then it would cost $1.787 million. That would come out of fund balance. That would assume, of course, that you would enact the legislation that would allow for that to continue in FY23. If you chose instead to give a commensurate retention bonus, i.e. a percentage of that increase, that annualized increase, on a monthly basis, it would be $596,000. So it's six one half dozen of another with regard to whether or not you give the increase ahead of time or whether you give it as a bonus on a monthly basis. If you decided that you wanted to give a retention bonus, we would advocate that it be done as what we call ad pay, uh, so that a, a, a small portion is added to somebody's pay every paycheck so that you don't have somebody getting a lump sum today and being gone tomorrow. So again, 9.5% overall increase, 1.787 million if you instituted the pay plan effective April 1, and if you did it as a retention bonus for the three months remaining in FY22, $596,000 a, uh, a month. Well, when, when would we vote on that? Because April's just around the corner. Yes, ma'am, we would, we would uh, bring that back to you at your next meeting. Um, with some sort of budget amendment that would then fund it. If you want to provide direction today, you certainly can. If you'd like for us to bring two different proposals for you to act on with a recommendation, we can do that. Let's just do it. I'm, a, I'm okay to move forward with it. I'm okay personally to move forward with it, but I'll, I'll look at my... Are, are we going to... Do we need to vote, or are we just getting we'll, a We'll need to bring you a budget ordinance amendment back okay, that's what I thought. at the next meeting. Mr. Mayor, which one are we talking about? Are we talking about the start in April 1st of $1.787 million or the retention bonus of 596 I'm talking about the one point seven to start with. We're all good with that. Are, are there any positions in the city that wouldn't qualify for this? The three appointed positions for the city by city council, Ms. Spicer Sidbury, Mr. Joy, and myself. Everybody else is included. Yes, sir. 
I'm good with that. <laughs> uh, Tony. Yes, sir, Mr. Spears. Why are those three um, positions excluded? Because they are not part of the, they have previously been part of the pay plan. What the HR uh, department was uh, advocating was to take them out of the pay plan. And that is the way they've traditionally treated across the state. Anybody who's directly appointed by council generally has the flexibility to be uh, paid whatever council deems appropriate, regardless of the pay plan. Okay. And that's, again, a generally accepted practice across the state of North Carolina. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I think you have a consensus here. For the 1.787? 1. 1. Yes. Okay, we will, we will prepare a budget ordinance for your consideration at the next meeting. With that, unless you have further direction or further questions, we are done for the afternoon, and we want to thank you very much for your time and your attention. It's been very helpful for us. Thank you very much. Thank you to the staff. Stand adjourned.